hi everyone, and I want to welcome you all back. My name is Adam Talaferro. I'm a former New Jersey State Assemblyman, and I lead strategic alliances uh, for the Southeast region at, at Bristol Myers Squibb. So, so during last year's Advocacy Days event, I had a roundtable conversation with uh, a few other state legislators, and there was so much discuss discussion. We decided to have a, a similar session this year. So, I am honored and, and privileged to be joined by three state representatives who are all committed to cancer care and advocacy. So before we get started, I just want to, I, I have your bio, so I want to read a little bit about each of your bios, and then uh, we're going to ask you a few questions. And, you know, I always say there, it's very rare that you get three sitting legislators from three different states to give their viewpoints on advocacy, because, you know, as patient advocates, we, we always have opportunities to do advocacy training, and there's these awesome advocacy toolkits, but it's all secondhand. And we, you know, we, you are the people that we are all trying to advocate to and, and get to know better. So I, I can't, and I'll say this numerous times throughout this conversation, I just can't thank you all enough uh, for your time and, and willingness to share your insights. So, so as we get started here, I would like to start with Representative Hannah Keynes. Uh, Representative Keynes serves as the state representative for the 11th Worcester District and was sworn in to serve her fourth term in January of 21. Rep. Kane serves as the ranking minority member for both the Joint Committee on Healthcare and Financing and the Joint Committee on Public Health. She is also a member of the Joint Committee on Mental Health, Substance, Substance Use and Recovery, and the new Joint Committee on Racial Equity, Civil Rights, and Inclusion. Rep. Kane has helped lead and shape policy on the state level, working in a bipartisan manner to grow consensus and advance critical legislation and budget priorities on public health, life sciences, health disparities, rare diseases, and food security. Last fall, Rep. Kane launched the Massachusetts Legislative Caucus on Cancer Awareness with Representative Thomas Golden. Rep. Kane received a 2021 Rare Impact Award from the National Organization for Rare Disease Disorders for her leadership in passing legislation and creating a Rare Disease Advisory Council in Massachusetts. Rep. Kane and her husband Jim live in Shrewsbury with their three children. Representative Kane, it's a pleasure to see you again and really looking forward to, to our conversation today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Adam. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Representative. Next up, we have Representative Steve Elkins, who was first elected in 2018 to represent Minnesota's House District 49B. Over the last decade of his private sector career, his work was focused on health information technology. His project work immersed him in the technology of electronic health records and provided an opportunity for Rep. Elkins to work directly with experienced nurse practic practitioners on a technology project, which is enabling them to provide better care to chronically ill Medicare patients. These experiences have provided Rep. Elkins with invaluable insights into the nature of the healthcare challenges, which has made him a very valuable contributor to legislative efforts to reform healthcare delivery systems. Rep. Elkins is leveraging this experience, as well as his education in economics, to lead the charge to bring transparency to all facets of the healthcare system as a member of the House Committee, House Commerce Committee. Representative Elkins, thank you so much with the snowy background in Minnesota. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And, and finally, we have uh, Representative Bill, uh, Assemblyman Bill Moen. Uh, Assemblyman Moen is from New Jersey's fifth legislative district where he was elected in 2019 and reelected in 2021. In his first term, Representative Moen focused on helping New Jersey's families and small businesses recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, improving transportation alternatives across South Jersey, and as the youngest member of the state legislature, serving as the voice on millennial issues at the state house. He was the first prime assembly, assembly sponsor of 13 bills that were ultimately signed into law. The highest number of any freshman legislator during the 2021 legislative session. Prior to his time in the legislature, Assemblyman Mullen served as an elected member of the Camden County Board of Commissioners, representing the over 500,000 residents of the county. For six years prior, Bill served New Jersey as the South Jersey Director for United States Senator Cory Booker. And he also served as a legislative aide in the 5th Legislative District where he helped draft state policy. Assemblyman Mullen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you. Good, great to see you. Um, as you heard, I served uh, as a legislator for seven years myself and was a colleague with Assemblyman Moen in the New Jersey State Legislature. And, you know, today's uh, forum discussion is to really help 
advocates better understand how they can engage with their elected officials. And also, you know, we also talk about sharing their story. When I, and, and I apologize if I say us and we, because I said I'm still a recovering legislator. So if I say that, I apologize. <laughs> I am no longer in the legislature, but I would always tell advocates, you know, I was the type of person that you could tell me facts, figures, and statistics all day. And two minutes after the meeting, I will forget it. But when I heard a, a patient story or an advocate tell a compelling story, that's something that would stick with me throughout the day. And I would tell my colleagues in the legislature, and I, I would recite that story uh, thousands of times to, to anyone I was trying to uh, uh, get on an issue. So before we get started, you heard all the bios of our distinguished legislators. In about two minutes, uh, or two minutes or less, I want to ask each of you, because we all got involved in uh, public service for a reason. There, there's something that drove us to get in this field, because it's not an easy field to be in. So I, I would like to start with uh, Representative Kane. Representative Kane, you know, what, what drove you to get involved in, in public service? I grew up in Maine, and when I was growing up, uh, when I was born, Margaret Chase Smith was uh, the senator for Maine, who was the first woman to serve in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. And um, I really, as a young child, was compelled by her leadership and her involvement in public service. And my family was very much community oriented and involved in lots of different things. So it seemed a natural step at some point in my life. Um, and I was a former small business owner. I've worked in both the public and private sector. So. Um, a part of the reason that I wanted to run was also I was concerned about the tone and tenor. Um, and I had been successful in the community advancing several initiatives um, because of the way that I approached the issues. And I thought that if I did this on the community level, you know, well, that I thought I should apply it um, at the state level. Well, th thank you for that. And I, I, I would always say I got involved in politics and someone quickly corrected me and said it's not politics, it's public service. And you all are truly public servants. And to you, Rep. Elkins, you know, what What was the, what, what forced you, not forced you, but what empowered you to get involved? Well, I just, I uh, kind of got sucked in gradually. I mean, I had always been uh, very active, even as a student. I was actually an intern uh, in D.C. Uh, from UC Berkeley uh, in the, the, the Watergate summer and uh, was there researching a paper on airline deregulation when Nixon resigned and uh, it was a historic time to be there. And so I always maintained that interest, but uh, uh, I, I, my early career, I uh, was in the airline industry as a practicing economist, but when I, I left the airlines uh, in the early 90s, I wanted to uh, s stay involved in transportation policy. And so I started uh, volunteering to serve on uh, transportation advisory boards or task forces for the school board and then the city and then the regional government. <clears throat> and uh, that, that led to uh, me running for the city council in Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, you know, almost exactly 20 years ago. And it just kind of progressed from, from there. I served on the city council, uh, a regional government council. And when that term ended in 2018, seat opened up in the house for, for my district and I decided to go for it. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Fantastic. And, and Assemblyman Assembly Mowen, how about you? Uh, well, so Adam, uh, I think I think you know this, but uh, for, for everyone else, um, I I'm a grandson of two World War II veterans, and uh, my uh, my one grandfather um, he lost his eye fighting in Italy, uh, received a Purple Heart from President Truman. Uh, my father is a disabled Vietnam veteran, and so I grew up, as you can imagine, um, um, I spent many of my holidays, uh, particularly July Fourth, Memorial Day, um, at our local VFW, and. Um, I, I would spend a lot of time interacting with veterans. And I think to me at, at such a young age, it left an imprint on me um, of the sacrifice and really the patriotism that um, these men and women had. And so as I carried that along through my, I think the rest of my childhood, um, I just found ways to get involved, you know, running uh, for class president and um, youth mayor of my town. Um, I think from those experiences, you're able to connect like that the mayor of your town and maybe the council members, um, they're just like you, they're, they're average people. Um, and I think that like is a, a perhaps a, a roadblock that for some uh, might exist where you don't think that, you know, that's something you could ever do. Um, so for me, at such a young age, I, I think that that was a key piece to me feeling comfortable um, in looking towards this as a career long term. Um, I think through numerous internships with um, our congressmen, um, our former Senate president, 
um, I, I just really uh, reinforced that interest. And so uh, throughout my first couple of years of working, um, I got involved with political campaigns while I was in graduate school. Um, and then ultimately I uh, had the opportunity uh, when Senator Booker, uh, then mayor of Newark, um, ran for the U.S. Senate. Um, I had a chance to uh, really uh, take take on that take the lead in opening up his southern New Jersey office, which um, represented the seven southern wow. counties of the state. And I think from doing that, um, I just I, I realized that I, I, for a lot of time I would be like the person that would interact with the community on behalf of the senator. Um, so then you start to get the idea that perhaps you could do it yourself. And so I ran for uh, county commissioner in 2015. Um, and was uh, successful, reelected in 2018. And as you had mentioned in 2019, I ran for the state assembly and was successful. And finally, uh, last year in 2021, I was reelected. And so uh, that's where I am today. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Assemblyman. And I said all, all three of your respective states are, are so fortunate to have each of you uh, representing your, your great states. And I, I often say, you know, as a legislator, and you know, there's, there's a ton of patient advocates that are watching this today. And advocates, you know, sometimes forget that as legislators, we're advocates too. You know, whether it's advocating to our constituents why they should vote for us, uh, advocating to our colleagues in the legislature why they should why they should support the bills that we're sponsoring. So there's, there's not a day that goes by. And also in our personal lives, you know, some of us uh, we have families. I, I have two kids that advocate every night that they should have dessert prior to dinner. So every facet of our lives we're being advocated to. So my first question to, to start the discussion today is, you know. Why is patient advocacy important to the work that you all do as legislators? And you know, how about we start with uh, uh, Representative Elkins on this question? Sure. Um, well, I'm a melanoma survivor myself. Uh, and hopefully, when I hit my next round of uh, CT scans uh, in, in in April, uh, will be five years cancer free, and I think my oncologist is going to be able to pronounce me officially cured. So we, we, you know, if you've had melanoma, you uh, you know it's 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 always going to be there in, in the back of your mind. But uh, uh, the journey that uh, I've been through as a melanoma survivor myself, uh, and at, at the time, uh, you know, being an employee of uh, of Optum Health, uh, so having the opportunity to see, uh, you know, the experience from both the uh, the side of a, a patient and you know what happens on the, on the other side, on the provider side and, and the payer side as, as well, gave me some uh, you know, key insights. And uh, I'm a numbers guy and uh, I, you know, I lucked into uh, uh, you know, discovering a, an oncologist who uh, specialized in melanoma, who was also a numbers guy and who gave me access to uh, uh, all of the, the research, uh, uh, contemporary research of, of five years ago, so I could you know, make in, in, informed choices. Uh, and then I was also on a, uh, a, a high deductible health plan, and I knew I was going to be looking at, uh, uh, you know, a, a significant out-of-pocket cost, and uh, uh, gave me the motivation to, you know, do a little bit of price shopping to find out, you know, how much things were going to cost. And so, uh, at the time, the standard of care uh, was, uh, you know, I, I could have gone on to uh, an, an, an adjunct adjuvant course of uh, ipilimumab uh, as uh, you know as a, as an option to stave it off uh, but after all <clears throat> the research that I did and after learning that uh, uh, a course of ipilimumab cost about a hundred thousand uh, dollars and has potentially horrible side effects and a relatively small uh, increase in, in your um, improvement in your prognosis I decided to just have uh, the surgery uh, it had spread to uh, uh, the sentinel lymph node in, in my neck the tumor itself was up on my right temple. So I had all of the, the, uh, the lymph nodes in the, the right side of my neck removed, uh, but it looks like we, we got all of the cancer and it's been a good decision. But anybody who's been through this also knows that uh, there are some very expensive, uh, different kinds of, of, of scans that are involved in uh, looking for, for cancer. So I've had PET scans, MRIs, I have uh, annual CT scans, uh, and they're all very expensive. And uh, this is uh, what in medical terms are called referred to as shoppable services. You can look at you can look around for radiology. It's not and you're scheduling it well in advance, and the prices vary considerably um, from one facility to uh, to, to the next. Um, you know, sometimes by hundreds of dollars for a particular individual CT scan, and it's like, 
uh, this is way too hard because I would use, you know, being a employee of a, a unit of United Health Group, I had access to their price shopping tools, but the price shopping tools that they had were all based on historic claims data. And I would use the tools, but the bill for the CT scan would always be $100 higher than what they estimated in their tool. And that's kind of why I decided to, you know, take on, um, you know, price transparency in healthcare uh, as, a, as, as a cause. Um, because any of us who are in that in, find ourselves facing expensive cancer treatments and significant out-of-pocket costs, I, I think people ought to be able to shop for, for you know, commodity services like the scan itself uh, and be able to get all of the information that they need to make fully in, informed decisions about what care they're going to have uh, in consultation with their oncologists and what it's going to cost. Yeah, yeah, well, first off, Rep. Elkins, thank you for, for sharing your personal story. And, and, and your recovery, it, it, I'm sure it provides so much hope, and inspiration to the melanoma uh, survivors and those that are in active treatment right now. So thank you for that. And, and thank you for the work that you continue to do in this space. Um, uh, Assemblyman Moen, uh, you know, when we talk about patient advocacy and, and the work that you do each and every day in the, in the legislature, what does patient advocacy, how does that impact the work that you do when, when you have a, an advocate that comes to, to speak to you? Uh, well, Adam, I, I think from from my perspective, and I, I think through this conversation with um, particularly the comments of Representative Elkins, um, you see from his perspective, you know, like individualized advocacy and how you apply that in your role as a legislator. Um, uh, I think that uh, for in certain cases, though, um, that that that's not the case for everyone, and so then you you rely on the patients, uh, perhaps the patient advocacy, to provide and paint the picture. Uh, for those that might not have a personal connection um, to the issue, you know, of that conversation. And so I, I truly value that important conversation that occurs um, in many instances, because uh, frankly, it, you know, for, for, for many, you just haven't, you haven't lived that, you haven't lived through it. So it becomes really such an important piece to not just understanding an issue, which is if you, if you take even a step back as legislators, it's our jobs to really understand these issues and then advocate in our own way to see passage on these things. And in order to do that, you need to have that understanding up front if you don't come to the table with it. So um, as I go about my day on specific issues um, that are tied to different, um, perhaps uh, I would say um, different diseases, um, different causes, those types of things, it is such an important piece of my deliberation and consideration um, to have those advocates um, speak to the issues that are important to them and, and individualize it for me to then be able to take their stories forward. Uh, thank you, Assemblyman. And I know, you know, as legislators, you know, one meeting you could be meeting with a group of farmers and the next meeting you could be meeting with a group of doctors and it could be all over the gamut. So I'll often say advocates, you are the expert in, in sharing your stories. And, and Representative Kane, uh, can you just tell us a little bit, you know, from your viewpoint, you know, what does the patient advocacy voice mean to you and the work that you do? Uh, I would say it's probably the most powerful um, uh, influence on our work. And uh, to your point earlier, that the stories that people tell when they come in and share their own personal reason um, for advocating with you, it really imprints on you in a different way and you remember it. Um, I always think a blend of both the personal story is powerful and then also data uh, to Rep Elkin's point, you know, and so both things I think are important uh, in helping to advance policy. Um, I'm uh, one of my three children has two chronic diseases. And so, um, I, you know, I've been an advocate myself, um, both sort of legislatively and then also within the healthcare um, realm in terms of you know, her care and making sure that she's getting what she needs as a patient. Um, and I think too that, you know, I always try and approach every conversation with somebody about, you know, what problem are we trying to solve? So I want to hear the story. I want to understand why you're here. And I also, you know, want to crystallize what it is that you think we need to be doing, what's not working, what needs to be focused on. Because sometimes I think patients and advocates, they get so focused on their story and it's powerful, but then I leave a meeting and I think, I'm not sure I understand enough about what actually they think is wrong in the system or what we need to fix. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a blend of both of those things. Uh, thank you, Representative Kane, because I, 
you know, that, that was my next question. I think all of you answered it uh, within your specific responses. And that was, you know, when, when you new advocates and also seasoned advocates, we, we often do role plays where, you know, someone serves as sits down and, and acts like the, the representative and, you know, us as advocates, we, 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 we practice. And, you know, the, the question is, you know, what are, what are legislators really looking for? Because you, we know we only have a short amount of time because your schedules are, are very full. When we're going into that meeting, what is that legislator looking for? And we heard, you know, the, 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 you know Representative Elkis talk about data and we just heard Representative Kane and Assemblyman Moe talk about the patient stories. But uh, I, I guess in, in, in a minute or 30 seconds, can you just say, you know, that the top three things that each of you are looking for when, when, when an advocate comes to, to meet you. And you may have already stated it, but just so are the, the folks that are watching that are maybe taking down a list of things that they have to check off when they're going to meet with the legislator. Uh, let's start with Assemblyman Moen. You know, what are the top two or three things that you want from an advocate when you're meeting with them? I think uh, from, from my perspective, uh, I think it would probably be um, the, like the background of the issue. So, you know, the, um, I, in a in a very uh, simple way, just sort of the thirty thousand foot view of of the issue in itself. Tie that to the data that uh, would show whether uh, taking certain action uh, or if you were to take certain action could result in uh, certain whether it's savings or uh, save in savings in terms of dollars, savings in terms of lives. Um, and then finally, I think the third piece would be those individualized stories, particularly someone who I, I would have the honor of representing in my own district, that I could then take that story um, and one, meet with that person individually, but also be able to speak to uh, that at the state house in, in terms of representing that individual with that issue. Great, great. Thank you, Sullivan. How about uh, Re Representative Kane? What about two or three things that you're looking for? I think as someone and Moen, um, you know, said it well, uh, you know, I'm also looking for the opportunity to do follow up. So sometimes we meet with somebody and they, they share information with us. And then we might talk to another colleague, we might hear from another person. And so you're sort of gathering additional information and thinking about, you know, what the person, and sometimes I like to go back and say, you know, I, I mentioned to a colleague this issue, they had a similar thing, but they said, you know, X, Y, Z, and I'm wondering if you ever looked at it that way, or if you came across that. So I think too, you know, the the sense that there are times where you want to connect with folks to have a longer term conversation. So it's not, you don't have to necessarily get everything out on the table all at once, but particularly, I think some key advocates are very good at beginning a dialogue and getting your interest and understanding, and then being there to serve for you to come back to and have additional conversations around um, to make sure again, you know, Every once in a while, there's a patient who has a very um, individual experience and they're very passionate about it, but it might not be indicative of everybody else's experience. And so sometimes, too, I think we're trying to understand, you know, is this something that pertains to you and your experience and is it localized issue or have you really um, uncovered something, um, you know, that is a much broader issue? And so we're going to want to seek additional input from others on it. Oh, thank you. And to our audience, it is not every day. Again, you get to hear this type of information. This is fantastic. And, and, and Representative Elk is we'll, we'll sure. round it out with you. Yeah, so um, I'll give an example because you know, you're, you're correct, uh, Adam, that with the politicians, we deal in stories. Uh, but this year, I uh, have a bill uh, on behalf of uh, um, folks who, who suffer from lymphedema, which is a especially uh, common, you know, side effect of cancer surgery for, for breast cancer uh, patients. But it's a topic that I ended up uh, uh, researching myself in my case, just to see if uh, I wanted to understand whether the risk of lymphedema, you know, from having the lymph nodes in my in my neck. Uh, um, removed, but um, the, the the one advice the the advocates group for this one, I you have to keep coaching them that what the when the bill is going to be heard in health finance and policy, uh, it's like oh we want this person to testify and this person to testify and this person and you have to tell them uh, okay hold on time out uh, chair Liebling is giving us 15 minutes uh, anything everything we want to say has to be packed into 15 minutes and I talked to chair Liebling and I know these are the things that she's interested let's have one or two testifiers and let's have them focus on, on this particular issue. 
Uh, and in the course of the hearing on, on this particular bill, a lot of the health plans were coming back and saying, oh, well, we cover this, uh, which scra has me scratching my head because all of the advocates were, were saying, no, it's not consistently covered. Um, and so part of that, you know, I'm, I'm confident that Chair Liebling is going to include this uh, lymphedema coverage mandate in her omnibus bill at the end of the session, and we'll get this across the, the finish line. But as a follow-up, I'm, you know, I'm going to put, to get, put together the advocates with uh, representatives of the plan to lay out, okay, what, what should, um, you know, what really should be covered in terms of lymph lymphedema compression garments and other things to have a direct dialogue between the advocates and the health plans themselves in this case. I think that's part of our role as well. No, that, that, that's, that's great insights. And uh, I'm sure our, our, our viewers are, are taking notes on, on, on this conversation because it, it's so important. And I, I'm keeping track of the time here. We only have about 10 minutes. I have a couple more questions that I want to get to. Uh, you know, we, we've been stuck in the pandemic for the last couple of years. And, you know, as we're here today, we're doing a, a virtual session. And that, that brings me to the topic of, of virtual advocacy and, and social media. How, you know, do you all use social media, you know, do, to connect with your constituents or advocates? Can you talk about, you know, how you guys use social media or, or the, virtual, the virtual environment that we're in today in your role as policymakers? And uh, let, let's start with uh, Rep Representative Kane on this question. Sure, certainly. I mean, I, I, I tend to use social media more to um, give information on either the work that I'm doing or something that's happening at the state level that I think it's important for constituents to know. Um, but I do, um, I like to meet with people. And certainly during uh, this period of time, it's been all, all virtual. Our state house actually just reopened. Um, so all of the advocacy work that I've been able to do with people um, has been uh, basically over Zoom or on the phone. And, um, you know, it, it hasn't diminished, I don't think, any of the power of advocacy. I mean, certainly being in person is wonderful. And I, um, especially, you know, if a patient is sharing something very personal and very difficult, you know, I would prefer to be in person to offer, you know, a moment of comfort. Um, but I think, you know, there's been incredibly powerful advocacy. And if anything, it has made um, the opportunity to meet with people easier. So, you know, they don't have to travel to the state house. Um, and we've had a lot more people testifying at our hearings who never would have testified before because of the ease of connecting virtually into our hearings. And so, you know, we're also, um, as we move forward, we don't want to um, suddenly shift back to having everything in person because we realize that you know, this, the virtual platform is a powerful one for making sure we're being more inclusive um, of everybody. So, um, but, you know, I, I always try to, as much as possible, um, engage um, myself in the direct uh, conversations with people um, around what, what their issues are, whether it's constituents or folks coming in because they're very um, connected to and, and are powerful advocates for a piece of legislation. I find, again, it makes me a much better legislator yeah. um, to either have the direct conversation or myself or a member of my staff um, who can then also share with me, you know, if the timing doesn't work, you know, around what folks are concerned about. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Kane. I say, you know, as public servants, we, we, we enjoy meeting with the public and talking to the public. And you, you hit on something talking about your staffer, which I'm going to get back to in a second. But before we get there, you know, uh, Representative Elkins, you know, from a social media virtual advocacy standpoint, what, you know, what are your thoughts? You know, how do you engage yeah. in that? So we all have uh, um, two Facebook accounts, one for our uh, um, campaign persona and one for our representative persona. Most legislators also, um, you know, uh, have Twitter accounts. I don't use mine that much. Um, but um, when constituents uh, send us emails, we add them to our, our newsletter list. And we, you know, I, I put a, try and put out a, a newsletter on what's happening uh, at least every other week in session. Usually it's about every week. Uh, and then I, uh, like Representative Kane, I have, uh, you know, found that there are, you know, in some respects, huge advantages to having uh, platforms like, the, like this one. Uh, our legislative assistants are, have not been in the office as well. It's been made it harder for them to uh, coordinate meetings. And so 
what I found is a very uh, efficient way of setting up meetings like this one is I'll just take a screenshot of my calendar for the week and send it to somebody and say, just send me an Outlook meeting request and embed a, a Zoom or Teams or WebEx link for any open slot you see that's uh, uh, convenient for you. And uh, it, it works very, very efficiently, actually. So I, I will spend most of my day today on Zooms like this one. Well, Representative Belkis, thank you for starting your day with us today. We, we yeah. appreciate it. And uh, over to Assemblyman Mo, and you know, as, as one of the youngest legislators in, in the state of New Jersey, I know you have used uh, social media and virtual advocacy truly uh, effectively. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit how you uh, utilize it? I have to say, I learned from the best in Cory Booker. Uh, Cory uh, is someone who I think uh, really harnessed uh, that um, ability and the, uh, I think, the connectivity that comes with uh, doing uh, communication work through social media. Um, I, I've tried to uh, really replicate in a local sense that model that, that he had put together while he was mayor of Newark and carried into the Senate. Um, I, when I was a county commissioner, uh, as you can imagine, the responsibilities, and Adam, I know you yourself were county commissioner at, at a point in your career. Um, th there's, a, there's a certain point, though, where the perhaps the interactions you're having um, as a county commissioner may be different from the ones you would be having as a state legislator. So for an example, I would be using my social media accounts. Um, I would tweet out um, the phone number for, you know, uh, at this time of the year uh, for pothole repair. So as a county commissioner, that would be one of our jobs to identify those potholes throughout the county on our county roads. Um, we would get responses to those tweets and uh, then we could we could really uh, fast track that uh, repair work. Um, as I shifted towards the legislature and, and took, took this new uh, role on, I, I found it to be very helpful in, um, I think, getting out the messaging, similar to what Representative Kane had said, getting out the messaging, um, I think particularly during the early stages of the pandemic, um, as folks were unsure of like what an unemployment process would look like. Um, and also as, as um, really as every day new um, executive orders were being put in place, uh, we found ourselves being like the, that intermediary between those orders and the public. And I think social media helped us uh, expand the net to more individuals that felt more comfortable interacting. Not everyone's comfortable calling an office uh, by phone. Um, and so they could easily send a message on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, that we could then through our staff um, really retrieve the, the accurate answer for them. And so I think it's a very, very uh, uh, important aspect of our lives as legislators. And I don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with, with any more with, with all of you. And we got five minutes left. And I think one of the most important questions that I want to ask you all, so if you could give me a, a minute or two, um, you heard, we heard Representative uh, Kane talk about her, her staff. And I'll, I'll have to say behind every great legislator, there's an even better staff. And there's that misconception at times that when uh, advocates go to, to meet with a legislator, if that legislator is not there, that that meeting was, was worthless. Or not worthless, but it, just, it wasn't as impactful. And I often say meeting with a staffer is sometimes even more important than meeting with the legislator. Because I know when I was a legislator, there were times, and I can say this now that I'm out the legislature, I would ask my, my chief of staff, you know, how should I vote on this bill? Because I, I hadn't had the opportunity to read the entire bill. And he had been in the meetings, he had read the bill through and through. So can you talk to me for about a minute? Um, we'll start with Representative Elkins. What does, how do you utilize your staff and what's the impact of advocates meeting with your staff? Yeah, in my case, in, in Minnesota, we have a very uh, large New England style legislature. Um, people don't know this, but Minnesota was actually the founding fathers were all Connecticut or uh, Yankees who came to Minnesota to apply their knowledge of uh, harnessing water power to uh, uh, found the uh, uh, wood mills and, and grain mills. So uh, there are 134 of us in the House, and each of us has to share one legislative assistant. So we probably don't have as much. Uh, ability to leverage our staff <clears throat> as, uh, um, uh, as perhaps smaller legislators with more staff per, per legislator would have. You know, personally, um, I, I rely very heavily on uh, our research staff uh, and the uh, committee administration staff for, for moving bills, uh, but I do find myself in a position where I end up handling uh, the lion's share of the constituent correspondence and, and outreach myself, actually. 
Uh, thank, thank you, Representative. And uh, we know, uh, Assemblyman Moen, you were a former staffer yourself. Uh, talk about you know the importance of, of staff and, and how you utilize it in your office. Adam, so I, I, I had the pleasure of, um, before becoming an elected official, um, working at different levels of government through internships and then um, in my early stages of my career in, in, in jobs that allowed me now as a legislator to see sort of both ends of that spectrum. Um, and I think I think the point that, um, that you had made, uh, we have so much incoming uh, in terms of correspondence, calls, uh, different issues that arise. You know, we're dealing with not only um, individual constituent issues that come in through the office, but also in a larger sense, some of the community issues that, are, that arise throughout the, the week um, with some of our local mayors and county officials. And so uh, staff becomes such a key piece to, I think, the operation of a legislative office. Um, and I can tell you that as a former staffer, um, we would be, in many, many ways, we would be responsible for um, more or less directing uh, the legislator, the elected official, um, in their next steps or action in considering different bills and, and sponsoring bills and voting in certain ways. Um, and so I, I think I'm very lucky in that sense that I have that background because then I know ultimately, if you, I think if you're a good legislator, you know where your weaknesses are and then your staff can help you there. Um, and so as you can imagine, in order to have the full picture of, of legislative work uh, and doing it the right way, uh, you're going to rely heavily on your staff. Uh, thank, thank you, Assemblyman. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up with uh, Representative Kane. And I had the opportunity to interact with your staff a little bit and fantastic as always. But you just tell me how uh, the importance of your staff and how do you utilize them in your work? Sure. And I think, you know, as as a legislator, um, early on when staff is first working with us, you know, I spend a lot of time and have them in meetings so they can see how I tend to ask questions and what's important to me and how to get, um, you know, the most information out that's most helpful to us as legislators. And so I think that that training early on then builds on their ability um, to know what it is that I'm going to want to know um, and how to um, work with people who are coming in to advocate, especially if they haven't advocated before and they're nervous or they're not really sure, you know, what's the best way to approach it. You know, our goal is to make it a comfortable and rewarding process for them and also to get the information that we need. Um, and so um, staff, I think by and large, um, they are incredibly good at getting um, to the heart of matters and, to, and then to relay that information to us um, when we're not able to be in a meeting. And I think, you know, you said earlier, um, you know, the, the people that work for us are also deeply committed to public service. These are not, um, you don't necessarily enter public service because you think it's a great way to make a fast buck. It is yeah. something that you feel compelled to do and that you really have a strong desire to help people. And so when you're meeting with staff, I think it's really important to understand that is, why they're there. They want to help. They want to help um, people. Uh, Re Representative Kane, I, th I think you said it well, and all, all three of our state representatives, it, it, I mean, we're, we're at our end of time. I could talk to you all day, and I just so value the, the, the insights that you provided. And uh, just speaking on behalf of the folks that are watching today, just want to say thank you. Uh, I know, you know, as, as Representative Kane said, you, you don't enter public service to be thanked. Um, but we want to say thank you because, you know, you all have given us 45 minutes of your time and I'm sure you, your schedules are jam packed, but for you all to help empower us uh, to, to share our stories and, and most importantly, you know, that to let the advocates know that legislators are, are normal people, just, just like, you know, we all come from humble backgrounds and uh, got involved to, to try to help people. So you, 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 your insights and your stories have, have truly made a difference. Uh, to the folks watching, you know, for folks that we have been watching from the great state of Minnesota, New Jersey, Massachusetts, please reach out to these, these fantastic representatives because as you heard, they're all here to help. And, and on behalf of the Melanoma Research Foundation, uh, Representative Elkins, Assemblyman Moen, Representative Kane, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for being there for the people. Representative Elkins, thank you for sharing your, your, your personal story. In, in overcoming melanoma and we wish you continued success in your recovery. Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of the day. So thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thank you so much.
thank you so much, everybody, again, for uh, listening in on that session with our, our legislators. And, you know, just wanted to take some time now to see if there's any questions. I see we have a few questions in the chat. And of course, you know, please feel free to, uh, you know, uh, put more questions in the chat. So we'll, we'll start up with our, our first question from uh, Liz Riley. And Liz asked, you know, what's the best approach when you have met before and the constituent wants you to change your mind? I think, you know, one of the most important things, you know, if, if you've interacted with that legislator before uh, and, and someone's trying to, to get you to change change their your mind on an issue is, again, as the uh, as our legislator said, is if we can have as, as much data uh, statistics on an issue, that that's truly, truly important. But I think the more patient stories, of course, it's great to have your own personal story, but if you're able to gather other stories from other folks that are going through similar situations, that only helps to bolster your cause on uh, a specific issue. So um, I, I can't say it enough, but I think we heard from our, our, our panelists as well, is that, you know, if we could combine the patient story along with data, you know, those facts and figures, that could certainly help an issue get across the finish line. And I, I'm looking to see um, if we have any additional questions, but you know, from, from my standpoint, as, as I said uh, during my comments, you know, I had the, the, the honor and privilege of serving as a legislator here in the state of New Jersey over seven years. Um, and, and during my time, you know, we were faced with a lot of different issues. And I, I, I think you know, the thing that always resonated with me, which you heard me say earlier is, is hearing from people and, and most importantly, hearing from constituents, people that I represent because I was always fiercely loyal to my constituents, but also to issues affecting my region and, and more importantly, the state. So I do see we have one more uh, question. It says, what should we do if the office of our member of Congress is responding to the MRS request for a meeting, especially if this member of Congress has participated in previous years? Uh, it, it could be frustrating. I, I could tell you firsthand, um, trying to uh, get in touch with legislators is not always the easiest of processes, but I, I tell you is to, to stay, stay persistent. Uh, you know, the, you know, all legislators have, you know, fantastic staff and unfortunately some of our requests and ask, you know, may fall through the cracks at times. So the, the, the best advice that I can give is continuing to stay persistent in your ask and, and, and please know that one of these times you're going to get through. And, and again, as we spoke about earlier, um, the, the, the power of uh, social media makes it uh, that much easier to, to reach out. So if, you know, if you're sending an email, if you're not getting a response via email, uh, you know, try their Facebook page, try their Twitter page, try if they've got a LinkedIn, uh, whatever way you can get to, to that person. Or also, you know, the old fashioned way, which we like to say, calling the office. Uh, and, and, you know, as the pandemic hopefully eases up, you know, reaching out and, and going directly to the office for those asks uh, is, is always a, a helpful way to go about it. So I, I think um, I'm, I'm, I want to be respectful of our time. I, I, I don't think I see any more questions in the chat, but uh, again, I would like to thank you all for the time today and certainly happy to stay connected as we go forward. So best wishes to you all and uh, I hope we have a great rest of the conference. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, it was really great to hear from all of the various state legislators on why the patient voice is so important in the overall advocacy process. So thank you for that great session. Um, hi everyone and welcome to our next session Meeting Your Lawmaker 101, Tips and Tricks for a Successful Meeting. Uh, my name is James Merrick and I'm MRF's Chief Communications and Marketing Officer. Communicating effectively during your meetings with your lawmakers and their staff is very important. Today, we are joined with two longtime advocates and melanoma survivors who are, who are with us here today to share their tips and tricks on how to make the most of your meetings later this week. First, we have Kristen McJunkins. 14 years ago, Kristen was diagnosed with stage 3A melanoma at the age of 38. After a treatment that included two surgeries and a year of interferon, she was thankfully told she had no evidence of disease. Wanting to advocate for research and treatment development, Kristen is an active participant with several organizations, and this is Kristen's sixth time 
participating with the MRF's advocacy days. She truly believes our collective voices can help eradicate this disease. We are also joined today by Liz Riley, who is the MRF's Senior Major and Annual Gift Development Officer. Liz was diagnosed in 2015 with ocular melanoma and shortly thereafter joined the MRF as she knew she needed to do more to find a new treatment options for patients like herself. Along with her husband and young son, Liz participates in advocacy, advocacy days each year, bringing a passion and deep understanding to the importance of sharing your patient story to advance the needs of the melanoma community. Kristen and Liz, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, would love to start our discussion with just a few questions. Um, I think I'll ask this first question to you both, Liz and Kristen. Um, as seasoned melanoma MRF advocates, how would you recommend preparing for your meetings with representatives and their staff this week? Um, we just heard from a few state legislators, but would love to hear what the top three things are that you would suggest advocates do as they prepare for their meetings this week. I'll go first. Um, hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I can't believe it's been so many years that I've been coming. It feels like just yesterday when I started. For myself, I am usually the only person from my state. I once or twice have had somebody with me, so we were able to split things up. But for myself, I tried to definitely review all of the information that the MRF provides us in terms of the asks in particular, and then really work to try to get my story straight. I've been very fortunate. I live in Connecticut and my representatives and senators have always been very supportive of healthcare and healthcare initiatives. So I have been fortunate that my conversations have usually been positive ones. And I've always met with the staffers and to the point of the previous panel, the staffers are amazing and really exciting and I think getting to know them and certainly sharing my story in a concise way while weaving in the details of the statistics and the asks has been important. Yeah, I would have to agree with Kristen on most all of that. Um, I, I do a ton of research before I go into my meetings every year. I always try to find like statistics about my state, like I lived in Colorado. So I always try to find out like how high of a risk are we being closer to the sun um, for melanoma and other interesting facts like that that would kind of grab the staffer. Um, and I have used and abused my family practicing uh, the night before my calls um, just so I know like I know what I'm talking about and I don't look like I'm just rambling off of a script. So um, use and abuse your family is number one um, and do some research because little stats, they, they mean a lot to the staffers. That's a great point, Liz, that you make about doing the research to be better prepared for your respective state meetings. Um, what are some of the, the places or, or websites or information that you've typically reviewed uh, to better help yourself prepare uh, for your state legislator meetings? So the MRF website, <laughs> number one, has a ton of information on it. And I don't just say that as an employee, I say that as a patient, it's the first place that I go for um, my stats and information. Um, I also go to like state institutions, like the University of Colorado is where I would go, the hospital. They have a ton of information on their page. Um, so check your university hospital, your institutions, um, they'll have information. But at the end of the day, your number one friend is Google. <laughs> it's probably the easiest. It pops up the most amount of information. Just make sure that you're getting it from a credible site, not some wonky donk site that is giving out false information. All great pieces of advice, Liz. Thank you so much. Uh, Kristen, a question for you. What advice would you give to advocates uh, who may be in meetings where there are potentially challenging or somewhat contentious situations that might arise? How would you recommend um, our MRF advocates handle uh, those types of situations? 
I think staying calm, I mean, nerves definitely come into play when, when you're talking. And if you are getting any pushback, you can get off of your game a little bit. I mean, to Liz's point, practicing what you're saying is helpful. But I think saying I understand your position or I understand the senator representative's position. And I just want to share from, you know, my patient perspective and the advocating for the research that we're doing and trying to circle back around, particularly to progress that's been made. Certainly since I was diagnosed in 2008, there, the only people that were qualifying for clinical trials were people that had very advanced disease. And because mine was cleared through surgery, I didn't qualify for any additional treatment. So there really was no adjuvant therapies that were available, such as are available now with melanoma, but have been available for many years with other types of cancers, such as breast cancer and, and things like that. So I think pointing that out and then particularly knowing what your legislature support. So, uh, you know, when Liz and I were talking about this meeting, um, many of our representatives might support the military. So really highlighting some of the effects of melanoma on military members. If that's something that your representative supports, that might be a hook to engage them a little more. And then, you know, at the end of the day, if they're providing pushback, saying thank you very much for your time and, and following up with the information and statistics that you have. That's that's really helpful advice. You know, hopefully, folks on the call, you know, your meetings will be smooth and wonderful, and we of course hope that for you. But Kristen, that's some great recommendations and advice for just in case those those meetings are um, a bit more challenging for for whatever reason. Uh, so, Liz, a, a question for you in terms of you know, as you're developing sort of your ask or your elevator pitch, if you will. How would you recommend advocates go about telling their story um, and creating that really successful elevator pitch? Um, so the biggest thing for me is remembering that I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know anything about melanoma. Um, so I try to keep my story passionate and kind of under, you know, you wanna target the heartstrings but you also don't want to get them lost by talking about a lot of terminology or a lot of medicines and stuff like that. They, they most likely don't know what the medicine is. Um, so it's just, to me, the story should be, you know, a, a storyteller that you're, you're talking about your emotional and your physical journey um, and that you're not um, dragging on too long. So tell your story, be passionate about it. I try to keep mine in under five minutes. Um, I can typically do it under two and still be pretty passionate about it. Um, you know, but, but you are there to tug at heartstrings. I mean, like Kristen said about I, I, saying to them, I understand this is not your position. And at the end of the day, I hope they understand that this is my life. So, um, you know, it's a much bigger statement when you're talking about your life versus, you know, your life with MRIs and, and other weird drugs. So talk on the passionate side on it. Talk about your life um, as a human with melanoma, not just the medical terminology side. And Liz, sort of along those lines, are there any keywords that you would um, highlight during your specific meeting or words or phrases that you would perhaps avoid uh, during your, your upcoming meetings? I don't know about keywords. I mean, I I like to use words like my struggle, you know, things that, that, that kind of accentuate the fact of, of, of what you've had to go through or, you know, like I'm an ocular melanoma patient. So my struggle is trying to find clinical trials within the rural America. I now live in Missouri, so there are no clinical trials in my state. So trying to find words like that, that can, can kind of bring in the compassion, um, I, I think is key. Um, things that I would avoid, you know, they don't need to know that I had radio plaque therapy to my eye. They don't know what that is. They probably don't care. But for me to dumb it down and say, I had to have a button sewn on the back of my eye, which did radiation so I wouldn't affect my brain is probably a better statement to them for them to understand kind of what I'd gone through. 
So it really is, you know, we're, I don't think we realize as patients how smart we have become about our own cancers. We're, we're almost like little mini, you know, doctors in, in, um, in training, but they, they are not. So trying to make sure that you're talking to them as if you were talking to like, you know, your younger child who doesn't know anything about medicine. Thanks, Liz. Kristen, a question for you, you know, as a, a, this being your, your sixth time participating in the MRF's advocacy days, what advice would you have for, for new advocates in terms of um, making sure they quell any nerves that they may have as they approach their meetings? What, what helpful tips, Kristen, do you have to, to maybe help reduce some of those nerves um, for our first time advocates? It's a, it's a good question and I, I still get nerves and then and in some ways I think nerves are actually a little helpful. I mean, because I think as Liz said, this is our lives, whether it's we're the patient or we're advocating on behalf of a family member, this is really important to us. And then certainly depending on where we live. Again, I, I think, you know, participating and viewing the sessions today really energize me and get me excited to talk to the staffers this coming week and just you know, watching the videos and, and honestly reviewing the progress. I mean, every year when I do this and I can see the progress that we've made in the research, it's so exciting. And, and I still participate in my support group through the hospital where I was treated. And when I share my story with new patients, they don't even know what I'm talking about because they've had options when they get diagnosed now. And to me, that's fabulous. And so I, I try to make a point of sharing those types of things. And along the lines of statistics, I, again, knowing if you can find the information on who your staffers are that you're meeting with. So I'm usually meeting with people that are probably in their 20s and 30s and it's always been women. And so, you know, to really point out that this is the deadliest cancer for young women, I, I think that helps drive it home a little bit and, and knowing that I'm confident in those statistics and um, what I'm sharing, I think that makes the conversation go better. and. I think that, I mean, they're busy people, but uh, they do enjoy talking with their constituents, uh, or at least I've found that. And so I, I think knowing that it can be an engaging conversation, even though it's going to be quick, can help calm the nerves a little bit too. And I think even just to echo a point that Liz made earlier, you know, practice makes perfect. The more you can ahead of time review sort of the quick facts about your district and, and learn um, what your particular representative is interested in or is passionate about the policy areas that that individual um, uh, supports is, is all those different activities can better prepare you um, for your specific meetings. And after today's training session, we'll actually um, have opportunities for folks to break out into smaller sessions um, to meet amongst themselves and, and practice these meetings as well. So um, definitely just wanted to echo Kristen and Liz's points that, that practice can go a long way in helping you feel more um, ready for your upcoming meetings. Uh, Liz, wanted to, to pivot over to you with a question. Uh, we heard earlier from some of the state legislators about leave behinds and also what work we can do to follow up um, our meetings after this week. Uh, how do you typically, Liz, weave in your uh, leave behinds or materials for um, staffers and their representatives? And what advice do you have for folks in terms of how to continue with the advocacy process after um, Advocacy Days completes this week? That's a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I always start off my call asking if they had received the packet ahead of time. Um, if they hadn't, you can typically send it to them in the chat. Um, if not, I let them know that I'm going to follow up with an email as soon as we get off the call with the information um, to leave behind for them. Um, so at the end of every meeting, I'll go back onto Zoom and get their email address off of the invite list. Um, and I will immediately email them and just say, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I will always put a little blurb about my story in there as a reminder to them of who I was because they do sit in meetings all day long. 
um, and then the follow-up packet. And at the end of it, I say, um, I'll be following up with you in the next week or two. You know, I look forward to hearing more about where the Senator or the Congressman or Congresswoman stands on this. Um, and then I use and abuse that staffer <laughs> for everything that I need in my government locally um, to help me, whether it's, I got a denial on my insurance. They are great advocates to go against, you know, like Kaiser in your local state or somebody is denying something for some weird reason. They're great advocates to go in and be able to help take care of that. Or, you know, my son has two parents with melanoma. So we're, we're huge advocates in getting sunscreen in school without having to bring in a prescription. I use and abuse them for that too. So whatever relationship you make, could end up being a very close friend of yours somewhere down the line because you will annoy them with everything that you need, but they do work for you. So remember that when you're going into a meeting that also helps with nerves. Um, but yeah, so that's what I do with the legal ways, the takeaways, sorry. And Kristen, I'll ask the same question of you in terms of the meetings that you've had in the past. Uh, typically, how do you approach any follow-up um, and how do you even leave behind materials after your meetings have completed? So I, I always thank them for their time. And then I, I try to, again, you know, point out, like I said, I've been fortunate with the people that I've met with that my representatives have been very supportive of healthcare. So I always am weaving in, thanking them for their continued support for these healthcare initiatives. And then utilizing the MRF materials, sending a thank you note in addition to, so that they're receiving the information multiple times. I know they receive it ahead of time, but I'll send that information um, again in my, my thank you information, asking them to follow up if they have any questions. And then you know, we'll try to reach out again, um, You know, certainly around the time of voting and, and things like that for the bill, just to again, give a, one more push. No, that's that's definitely really helpful, Kristen. And in the past, have there been any resources or information that uh, the folks that you're meeting with, whether the representative um, themselves or their staffer, is there any information that they typically will provide to you during your meetings? And they haven't provided anything. So one of, one of my senators, I mean, he sits on the appropriations committee, so he has a very extensive form. So I'm usually having to follow up with the MRF for them to complete that information, um, you know, just because he's very particular in terms of, you know, what he will vote for, because I, I think um, he's just also an advocate for finance reform on many levels of the government. So, uh, you know, he's usually requiring some additional information or, you know, specific contact with the MRF, but um, otherwise they don't, they, no one has provided anything to me in the past. Great. Um, question for you, Liz, what's uh, been the most challenging component of a meeting with your representative or their staffer, and how have you overcome uh, that particular challenge in the past? Um, wow. I don't know if there's ever been like a challenge. Um, you know, I've had one staffer that was consistently late every meeting that I had ever had with them. Um, and really I knew wasn't gonna vote on my behalf for anything that we had asked for. So it was just that challenge of how do I, how do I get through to this person and actually get this conversation going? Because sometimes, um, most of the time they seem very engaged, but every once in a while you'll get one that's just, you can tell are not engaged. So, you know, how do you get them there? Again, I'll go back to storytelling of how do I, how do I relate my life as a 50 year old mom of, you know, like to this young 20 something year old staffer that really is just starting out their career and everything. And I think Kristen brought up the great fact of like the younger women um, having melanoma and, and like bringing in points and topics like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can definitely, you can feel awkward at times, um, but I don't know if it's a, a full challenge. One of the, the challenges that comes to my mind, Liz, we heard from um, in the previous session 
really related to the need for brevity and, and making sure that meetings are concise. The, the folks that we're meeting with this week are, are obviously quite busy. Um, yeah. So a challenge could really be just making sure that you're able to uh, communicate your, your story, um, get that ask out, have that conversation in a concise way um, to really grab the attention of whomever you're meeting with. So yeah, time uh, appreciate- is limited. Time is very limited. <laughs> Are, are there any tactics that you, Liz or Kristen, have used to, to better time keep or, or make sure that your meetings are being held in a concise way? I think for me, it just goes back to practicing again. Like I time myself, I kind of have an idea of how long it's going to last. Um, I try not to go over 10 minutes because typically that's where you seem to kind of lose them or they get rushed off to their next call. Um, you might be slotted for a half an hour with them, but you really only have like 10 minutes, maybe. I don't know, Kristen, have you had more time than that? Uh, no, it's so I, I absolutely miss being in person. However, last year, since last year was the first virtual one, I actually felt like the time went was managed better and I, well last year I don't know if the staffers are back in the office now but last year most of them were were working from home so they really did seem to have the half hour slots I don't think any of them any of my sessions went more than 20 minutes but um when I was in person it really felt like they were needing to get somewhere else quick or that you could see there was five other people in the waiting room or, or something like that so in this virtual world, I don't know if time has been managed a little better, but <laughs> but definitely reading the room. I mean, the, just the, the typical cues if they're shuffling papers around or looking elsewhere or trying to cut you off a little bit, then you kind of know you need to wrap it up. No, that's that's a very good point. Using using the, the virtual platform can perhaps uh, better keep everyone on time and on target there, Kristen. So thanks for thanks for making that point. Can I interject you, you know, on one thing? Liz. There's Please been go. times that I've had a staffer go to rush me off, like right off the bat. And I like have to remind myself, they're paid to be here because of me, because of the voter. And at the end of the day, my voice is what keeps them at a job. So they're going to give me the five to 10 minutes, whether they want to or not. So if you feel like you are too rushed, take a second. Like their time is valuable, but they should at least give you a minimum of 10 minutes. And I will say that because there are some out there that will try to just, hi, what do you need? Do you have takeaways? Great, blah, 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 I gotta go, bye. Yeah, no, that doesn't, don't let that slide. You need to stand your ground, be your own advocate and take that 10 minutes that you deserve. Sorry, I get a little angry. No, that's that's uh, that's exactly the sort of advice, Liz, that I think that folks, especially folks who are participating in advocacy days uh, for their first time would would love to hear. Uh, just in general, Kristen and Liz, are there any other pieces of advice, uh, tips, tricks, things that we think um, folks should know uh, before stepping into their meetings beginning tomorrow? Try, I mean, it can feel nerve wracking, but Try to have a little fun, and and I think when you show your excitement for why you're there, I mean, and again, it's really personable, personal, and depending on where we are in our stage of treatment or caring for somebody else, I mean, time can really be of the essence, so it it can be emotional as well. But I, I think for me, and I, I've said this you know, to so many people because you feel so helpless. I mean when you're going through treatment, when you're diagnosed with cancer, I mean, there's, you just feel helpless. And for myself, this is something that I feel like I'm doing that's tangible. I mean, it's fast and I never know what the outcome is ultimately going to be. But again, for over these years, being able to see the progress that's been helpful. So that's really, I think is is what's exciting. And, and I, I, I think these staffers, again I think you know to the previous panel's point like they they're not getting in this to get rich either and that they really are looking to connect and make a difference and I think trying to for myself you know that I'm helping them do that too that they're, they're really trying to connect um you know it just frames it a little better for myself 
So I would just tell people, my son used to go to Hill Day with me every year. And I think the first time he went to Hill Day, he was nine. Um, and he spoke on his own to the representatives. He did everything. And if my nine-year-old can go out and do it, um, anybody can. Um, and I think it's great for those of you that are on here that are, are caregivers, um, that aren't patients, because your voice is, is just as important as my voice or Kristen's voice. Um, but yeah, like Kristen said, have fun, enjoy yourself, know that, that they are, they are here for you um, to make sure that you have the moment to tell your story and, and, and just, just have fun with it and get to know your staffers because again, you will use and abuse them if you need to down the line. Um, don't just think this is a one-off, make sure you become good friends with them. And that process of becoming good friends with them, I think, is a great way to make sure that the conversation is continued after this week. Um, I think, like Liz and Kristen have said before, the advocacy process is not one that has to stop on March 11th. You know, we certainly hope that you continue to engage at the local and state level um, and also continue to engage with your federal legislators uh, moving beyond just advocacy days week. Um, before we move on to any participant questions, and just a reminder that you can use the Q&A box to type any questions that you may have, um, but I'd love to simulate what an actual meeting with your legislator um, or their office staff may look like. So if I could ask Liz to play the role of a congressional staffer, um, and Kristen, if you could play the role um, as a melanoma advocate from Connecticut, um, and maybe do a, a quick mock run of how your meetings will go this week. Do you want me to be interested or non-interested, Kristen? Your Let's choice. have, oh, Kristen, you can decide. <laughs> um, so, I mean, my paperwork's written out for somebody that's interested, but <laughs> feel free to <laughs> do what's best for you. Or, I mean, maybe- I'll, I'll, I'll start more. off not interested and then I'll, I'll see if you catch my interest in my mind. <laughs> okay. I think I might have a hook. <laughs> okay, good. Hi, I'm Krista McJunkins. Thank you so much for taking the time today to meet with me. I know you're really busy and I'm here on behalf of the Melanoma Research Foundation. I'm one of your constituents and I live in Wallingford and I'm a 14 year melanoma survivor. And today I'd like to discuss defense funded melanoma research. Were you able to review or did you receive the materials that the Melanoma Research Foundation sent out? Ahead of time. I, um, I, maybe, I think. Let totally me, understand. <laughs> totally understandable. Maybe. I'm sure you get okay. all kinds of oh, things. Oh, yes. Here it is. I have it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Well, just to provide a little bit of background, melanoma is the deadliest form of skin cancer, and skin cancer is the most common form of cancer in the United States. However, melanoma is not just skin cancer. It can develop anywhere in the body, including the eyes, nails, scalp, and other places. Rates have been rapidly rising over the past 30 years with invasive melanoma, the fifth most commonly diagnosed cancer in the United States. However, it's also the leading cause of cancer death in women aged 25 to 30, and the second leading cause in women aged 30 to 35. In 2008, I was diagnosed with stage three melanoma at age 38. I had two extensive surgeries on my left eye that thankfully achieved clear margins. However, without any qualifying additional preventative treatments, I was given interferon for 11 months, which basically made me feel like I had the flu the entire time. And I was told that there was less than a 10% chance that it would have any effect in preventing future melanoma. Though I've had other types of skin cancer since that time, I've been fortunate that so far the melanoma hasn't returned. But on a different note, knowing how you feel about the military and support of um, military research and, and things like that, melanoma is actually a unique and major threat to our military community which carries out most of its missions in environments of extreme solar radiation. Decades of studies from the time of World War II to the current generation confirm linkage of exposure to the development of deadly melanoma. According to the Pulse, which is the online source for Uniformed Services University, 
melanoma is the most significant cancer to affect the active duty military population. Additionally, a Vanderbilt School of Medicine study cited that only 22% of military personnel were made aware of the risks of sun exposure, while 77% reported being exposed to bright sunlight for more than four hours a day. But what's really striking to me was only 27% reported having regular access to sunscreen. Another study in the Military Service Monthly Report found that a 10-year surveillance period from 25 or 2005 to 2014, malignant melanoma was one of the most frequent diagnoses among male service members and the second most frequent cancer diagnoses among female service member. Continued innovation in melanoma prevention, detection, and treatment is only possible with the continued investment in high quality research. Are those statistics in the takeaway? Um, yes, I can double check, but I will certainly send those along following up this meeting. That would be great. Anything else that you have on the military that's statistics wise, if you could just send me that as well, that would be great. Absolutely, thank you. And, and so with that, um, one of our asks for today is if you would be willing to support a $40 million defense funded melanoma research in the fiscal 23 Department of Defense Appropriations Bill. Well, I will have to talk to the Senator about that. Um, he has always been a huge supporter of the DOD funding. So um, I'm pretty sure you can expect his signature on that. Um, but I will definitely get back to you on it. Great, and I will certainly follow up with additional information. Are there any other asks you have of us today or is it just DOD funding? Uh, no, we have a couple other asks and uh, we were hoping that um, the Senator would support increased funding for the NIH and the National Cancer Institute. The Senator's then, not very big on cancer research, so... Um, if you have more information, you can send it on. I, I absolutely will. And then we would also like um, support for 5 million for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Skin Cancer Prevention Activities for the Fiscal 23 Labor Health and Human Services Appropriations Bill, because we really believe that early education can help prevent melanoma, which is an extremely preventable disease in most cases, if people have the proper tools. Did you say almost pre pre preventable? There are certainly certain types. So most melanoma can be caused by UV radiation. However, there are definitely some melanomas that don't have primary spots and it can start in other places. Well, great. I will actually pass that information on to our health staffer um, and, and maybe they will reach out to you for more information. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And thank you for your support of the Senator. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you. Liz Riley, President. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen and Liz, that was really, really helpful and I think uh, provided a really good example um, of how to handle uh, your representative or senator meetings um, in the instance that that may be a bit more of a challenging meeting. Thanks, Liz, for <laughs> um, taking on that role. But uh, that was, again, a really, really helpful uh, sort of overview of how to ensure that your meeting is concise and brief. Um, Kristen, thanks so much for putting together those wonderful asks um, as well. So I don't see... So I know... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Liz. I know there's a couple of times that I've had meetings that whoever I'm meeting with is working on something healthcare-wise, and they will hear something in the pitch and be like, oh, did I tell you we're working on this? Is there a way that we could get support for this that we're working on with all these other senators and congressmen? Um, so just be prepared for that type of information, write it down, um, send it back to us and or to the MRF and um, we'll handle it on this end, but it's also a great way for you to continue that relationship. So um, just if you hear any information like that, let us know. 
And just to follow up um, really quickly with Liz's point, you know, if there is any information that you would like uh, to provide back to the MRF based on your meetings with your representatives or um, senators, you can always reach out to us at advocacy at melanoma.org um, and we'll uh, confer there. Kristen, did you have any other pieces of advice, tips, um, or tricks for our participants today? No, I, I mean, I, I know we'll have the session later where Ed really goes through things. I always find that extremely helpful in polishing up my asks and, and things like that. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll give everyone just a few seconds if you do have any questions. Um, in addition to the session with Ed Long that we have coming up shortly, um, just as a reminder, we will end today with a special breakout session um, where you'll have an opportunity to work directly uh, with other members from your state caucuses um, to actually practice uh, those pitches like Kristen and Liz have just done. So just another great opportunity for you to get some um, training in before we kick things off officially tomorrow. Um, and looks like we do have a question. Um, any chance of getting a copy of Kristen's note with her stats? Um, Kristen, I think folks were really interested in, in some of the research um, that you had done. Uh, we can certainly email that um, out to participants um, after the fact. Yeah, and just I all of those stats I pulled off of both the material that was sent within the last few days from the MRF as well as the main education page of the MRF site. Perfect. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so with that, uh, we have fin finished a few minutes early, so we'll extend our a break just a little bit to give folks a chance to use the restroom, stretch your legs a little bit, uh, but we will be back at 2.15 p.m. Eastern time uh, to finish out the sessions for today. Would love to take a moment to just thank again our panelists, Liz Riley and Kristi Kristen McJunkins. Thank you both uh, so much for a great session. Um, and hopefully this was really helpful for all of our participants. Go get them, guys. Go get them. Yes, thank you. This was Thanks fun. All. We got this. Yeah. All right, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a nice break. And I feel like Liz, Liz and Kristen's session was a really nice segue into our topic now. Uh, Kristen gave a great um, demonstration of how she's going to talk to her lawmaker about our asks, and that is one of the topics that we're going to zero in on now. So we are going to now learn a little bit about the what we call the CDMRP, which everything's an acronym. It's the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, Melanoma Research Program, or MRP, a program with which the MRF has played a really critical part in over the last four years specifically from nominating consumer advocates. You heard Doug chat about that earlier to serve on the review panel of the, of the grant applications to advocating for funding through our annual Hill Day, which we're gonna do this week. So right now we are joined by Dr. Amy Bunker. She serves as the program manager for the Melanoma Research Program within the CDMRP, um, US Army Medical Research and Development Command. As program manager, she's responsible for administering the program life cycle to include the annual review of the program mission and vision, development and release of research funding opportunities, which is actually funding the critical research to help melanoma patients, overseeing the two-tier review of the proposals and overall management and evaluation. So all good things that are gonna benefit melanoma patients. Dr. Bunker joined the CDMRP in 2015, and prior to assuming her current programmatic responsibilities, she managed a large portfolio of active research projects that included basic translation and clinical studies within the field of multiple sclerosis and cancer. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Bunker. Wonderful, thank you so much for the introduction. I am excited to be speaking with everyone here this afternoon albeit virtually. So without any further ado, I'll just jump right in. As Kylie said, I am from the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs. We refer that to that as CDMRP, 
I am the program manager for the Melanoma Research Program, MRP. Uh, I, I try very hard to keep the acronyms to a minimum, so hopefully these will be the two most common ones that you hear throughout the rest of the talk. So before diving into the program specifics, I wanted to bring a little bit of our processes to this meeting today. A lot um, of our program meetings and even many of our internal ones, we frequently start with what we refer to as a moment of silence and really to pause and reflect and remember why we are here as a program, as an organization. So in that spirit, I wanted to bring to attention some of the individuals that maybe some of you in the room know, and at least one that I'm pretty sure you do not. So we are here as a program because of people like you and others who have survived melanoma, such as C. Silver, Stephen Silverstein, excuse me, uh, who is former uh, board chair of MRF, course and um, has served on the programmatic panel for the peer-reviewed cancer research program and then the melanoma research program for many years. And so he really brought to us that voice of the survivor community. We also have uh, Samantha and Valerie Guild who were the uh, who currently run and her uh, Valerie uh, set up AIM at Melanoma in honor of Charlie Guild, Valerie's daughter, Samantha's sister, um, who they lost to melanoma. And and the more personal note from the CDMRP perspective, we have Aaron McKinney, who we lost in 2017 to melanoma. So it's these voices are just a few of the many who we keep in mind as we go across um, throughout our day-to-day -day business and we never forget that. Uh, going forward, I'm going to go ahead and give you a larger overview of who we are, CDMRP as an organization, what we mean when we say the program cycle, and give a bit of an overview of the activities of the Melanoma Research Program and what we've accomplished since we've come into existence as our own program. On a day-to-day -day basis and as an organization as a whole, we really keep um, in mind the vision of our organization to transform healthcare through innovative and impactful research. And we accomplish this mission by responsibly managing collaborative research that discovers, develops, and delivers healthcare solutions for service members, veterans, and the American public. This is something that, again, we hold very dear and we take very seriously as an organization and how we approach the management of the research programs we have been tasked to execute. Many of you may know or may have heard that we fall under the DOD. So what does that mean? This picture gives a simplified overview of how CDMRP fits into the overall structure. The appropriations that we do receive come to us through uh, line items in the Department of Defense budget. We fall under the Department of the Army for now that we're working on transitioning into what's going to be called the Defense Health Agency, but that's a story for another day. Uh, and we execute the programs we've been tasked to manage as part of the Army Futures Command and the Army Medical Research and Development Command. That's where we are as a program. Some of the hallmarks that CDMRP as a whole really embrace and what we think sets us apart from other funding organizations is that we work really hard to avoid duplication with other funding agencies and really put in a lot of time and effort to identify targets and unfunded areas of need. So we don't want to just throw more money at other 
needs that other agencies are tackling. So what isn't being done and what can we do to fill those holes? That's, that's something that we try to aim very highly for. When we were first stood up as an organization, the National Academy of Med Medicine did a review and offered us a recommendation for how we would be able to best set us up as a, ourselves up as an organization and achieve our mission. And they recommended that we follow a two-tiered model for application review. The two primary tiers are a merit-based peer review and then more of a portfolio uh, composition programmatic review that we call programmatic review. I'll go into a little bit more what that looks like and what the details of those processes look like on our day-to-day -day basis. Another item that really sets us out, we think sets us apart, is that consumers participate throughout the entire program cycle. And we really embrace the consumer perspective as our true north as an organization. And by consumers to us, that means uh, first and foremost, people who are living with the diseases or injuries of the programs that we manage, people who have survived those diseases and injuries. Uh, in some cases, depending on the nature of the condition, it might be caregivers or family members, but really these are the people who have lived experience with these areas. And so we think it's important to keep their voice engaged and give them a say throughout all of these processes. Each program on an annual basis adapts its vision and investment strategy to make sure we're still hitting those key milestones and really fulfilling the needs of our communities. We have a lot of flexible flexibility with our funding. And that means that we don't just go down a list of applications and say, okay, we're funding all the ones to this line. We really care about making sure that we choose both the best research, but also the best research that's meeting the needs of our programs. We value very highly transparency and accountability to our stakeholders. We put um, a lot of information about recently funded applications on our website, who is serving on our peer and programmatic panels. So we really try to put that out there so everyone can see what we're doing. Um, and last, but certainly not least, is we do all of this with the eye on keeping our management costs low. So the more efficient that we can run, the more of our appropriations will be able to get put towards research dollars. A snapshot of our FY21 organization-wide appropriations. So these are the most recent values that we have at this time, as everyone is aware, uh, I'm sure, that we're still awaiting our FY22 budget but just based on last year, you can see that as an organization, we were uh, managing over $1.5 billion in congressional appropriations. There are 37 programs listed on this table and the melanoma research program is highlighted there in orange and showing that for FY21, we had $30 million in appropriations. Moving on now to a little bit of a closer look at our program cycle and what that involves. This is what we affectionately refer to as a Krebs cycle. So anyone who may have taken a high school or college level biochemistry course may have recognized that term, but really this is the life and process, life blood and of the processes that we follow. We start up here with the congressional appropriation. So whenever the budget is passed and we know for certain what we are going to be working with that fiscal year. We have a vision setting meeting that identifies where, again, as I said, what those needs are for the year, what type of funding opportunities are going to be released to meet those needs, and then going through our two tier process. So there may or may not be an applicate pre-application process, but there will always be a peer review and a programmatic review. After programmatic review, we have a list of funding recommendations. And these are the projects that have been selected for funding and barring some technicalities are likely to be moving into open applications. 
and the arrows in red really demonstrate the active grant management process, uh, award management process, and tracking to make sure the projects stay on task, uh, make sure they're meeting DOD policies and regulations, and most importantly, tracking to make sure what tracking to see what comes out of those funded efforts. So what are the research outcomes? Have the applicants published their findings? Have they initiated clinical trials based off of the work we funded? Have they been able to file patent applications? What, what is the impact of that funding on the community? Here, uh, going back to the left, you'll see a stakeholders meeting that's grayed out. Those are held most often for new programs. So when, a new, when the melanoma research program came into existence as its own program in FY19, there was a stakeholders meeting where experts in the field, consumers, industry partners, and so on, came together to really hash out the big needs for the melanoma community. Um, those are only held at the beginning of the program and then maybe uh, intermittently as needed if another need arises or it's been the program's been going for a while and there the stakeholders feel there's a need to recenter so those those are only held when needed you'll notice the orange arrows pointing to certain parts along the cycle and those are all areas where we engage consumer involvement so consumers as you are all here today, you are really a big push for that congressional appropriation and what that looks like. The consumers sit on the programmatic panel and through there have a strong voice in guiding the vision of the program and the applications that get recommended for funding. The first tier of peer review, as I said, is, uh, excuse me, first tier of review is the peer review process. And this is really the technical merit assessment. So when you compare this particular application to the gold standard based off of criteria that's been laid out in the funding opportunity, how does it measure up? These, uh, the criteria base, as I said, come from the funding opportunities and the reviewers are really looking um, at how does that application stand on its own? It's, there is no comparisons at this level between one application and the other. These peer review panels are made up of both uh, scientific researchers, clinicians, uh, consumer reviewers, as I mentioned, uh, all coming together to uh, review these applications. We don't have a set standing panel for these reviews each year, we look at the applications that we receive and we make sure that we're recruiting the experts and the appropriate expertise to evaluate that year's applications. We do not share the identities of the peer reviewers with the applicants, so there's no direct communication between the reviewers and the people whose applications they're reviewing. At the end of this process, the outcome is what's called summary statements. These are each application receives a summary statement and they outline the strengths and the weaknesses of that specific application compared to the criteria outlined in the funding opportunity. After peer review, we have programmatic review. And this one is really where we have the comparison between applications. So we take the highest scoring based off a of technical merit and really start to look at portfolio composition, the needs of the program, how well did each application answer the needs of the portfolio as outlined in the funding opportunity, and what's really the potential impact of that application were it to succeed. So these are all uh, criteria and considerations that the panel weighs as it goes through the applications. And again, the programmatic panel is comprised of consumers, clinicians, researchers, uh, people who are really representing uh, diverse aspects of each research program's field. As needed, if there are a lot of 
applications um, more so than usual, or if there is a particular funding opportunity that requires specific areas of expertise that aren't otherwise already represented on the panel, then we can bring in what are called ad hoc reviewers to help out with those specific applications or um, of applications as needed. And the final outcome of the programmatic review is those funding recommendations. So out of all of the applications that we received, moving forward from this step, we have what's, with few exceptions, going to be our final list of uh, funded applications for that year. I have really tried to reiterate through a lot of these slides and point out when we have consumer activity and the involvement of our patient advocates, but why is that so important to us? Well, it's important to us because consumers and patient advocates are why CMRP exists, and we don't want to forget that. Grassroots consumer efforts um, back in the early 90s led to an initial $300 million appropriation for a breast cancer research program. And through continued efforts by patient advocacy communities, uh, the voices and experiences that consumers have really have played a large role in CDMRP's growth. And as I mentioned a few slides ago, uh, we, we've now grown to uh, $1.5 billion funding organization. And you as consumers and patient advocates participate at every level of CDMRP. Put that in perspective and what that means is that over 7,200 consumers representing over 1,200 organizations have served on CDMRP peer and programmatic review panels. The next several slides will focus on specifically the melanoma research program. Mentioned that since FY19, so fiscal year 2019, that was the first year that the melanoma research program stood up as its own individual program with an initial appropriation of $10 million. Before that, it was a melanoma and other skin cancers was a topic area under the peer-reviewed cancer research programs. And that was a topic area from FY09 through FY18. And PRCRP, peer-reviewed cancer research program, invested $51 million in melanoma research over that span. Since FY19, uh, the melanoma research programs appropriations have grown year by year. I mentioned before that in FY21, we had an appropriation of $30 million. The final counts of projects that we've been able to fund is still undetermined. We are still going through our review cycle, so that will be finalized in the next month or so. And we are still waiting to hear our FY22 appropriation. Based off of what we've seen in the language to date, we anticipate it being up to $40 million, but that's, as I said, still to be determined, and that's just a best guess at this point. I opened up this, converse, this conversation saying what CDMRPs vision and mission are as an organization, but each program also has its own vision and mission that it establishes as its uh, way to guide its individual programs needs. And so the vision of the MRP is to prevent melanoma initiation and progression. And our mission is to promote earlier interventions to enhance mission readiness and diminish melanoma burden on service members, veterans, and the American public. Melanoma is a broad area of cancer. Uh, the most common type of melanoma that we see and that we receive applications for is cutaneous, but there are several other, uh, whether you call them rare melanomas, variants, subtypes, what have you, uh, that are also important to our stakeholder community. And those are acral, mucosal, ocular, pediatric, and some, uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, so those are just some of the more common uh, areas of melanoma research that we see. 
one common question that we often get is why does the DOD fund cancer research? Why is the DOD funding melanoma research? And so this just next, this slide and the next one just kind of gives you a little perspective on it's not just an American problem, that there are other needs uh, specific to our military community as well. The, this is reflected in previous years, <clears throat> excuse me, um, budgets where the Senate Appropriations Committee has commented that it understands that melanoma diagnoses are increasing among active duty service members and that melanoma is the fifth most common cancer among veterans. Furthermore, uh, research suggests that exposure to high levels of radiation during young adulthood is associated with a higher risk of melanoma mortality. This is relevant because over 80% of active duty enlisted members are below the age of 39, making them young adults, and 40% of those are actually below the age of 24. And we see that a lot of them, especially when you're considering the ones who have served in Gulf War and Iraq and Iran, they're being exposed to more harsh conditions. Um, and what does this mean? Furthermore, furthermore, we have, uh, when we look into the military health records and dig into the medical encounters for malignant melanoma. So these are active duty service members or other DOD beneficiaries, such as the service members' families. Uh, when they are seeking out attention for melanoma diagnoses and outpatient encounters and hospital bed days. So this is really just kind of put in perspective and put some numbers that this is certainly something that is on the radar of the military health system. As a program, our programmatic panel and our stakeholders at the onset of the MRP's existence as its own program decided to issue a challenge statement. And we thought that this would be a good way for our program to set itself apart from some of the other funding organizations, whether it's NCI, MRF, aim at melanoma, or um, MRA, Melanoma Research Alliance. And what are we doing that isn't already being done? And so our panel really chose to focus on the concept of prevention. And that's not to say that uh, prevention in the normal sense that most people associate with prevention. So the use of sunscreen, the use of protective clothing, but really to take that concept and redefine it and expand it. So the graphic that is on the screen right now is a cartoon representation of melanoma pathogenesis. So on the far left of the screen, you see normal melanocytes carrying out their lives as normal cells behaving themselves. However, upon exposure to radiation or perhaps there's genetic risk factors, we start that melan that normal melanocyte can then start to evolve into something more serious. And so pathways can get activated in the cell, mutations can accumulate, and eventually that melanocytes can become a primary mel melanoma. And as if that primary melanoma is not caught early enough, then it can progress into metastatic melanoma and spread to other parts of the body. And so really we want to expand this concept of prevention by meaning basically stop cancer in its tracks. So we want to identify those genetic risk factors and people who have them and prevent them from leading to dysplasia, prevent those mutations from accumulating in that cell so that that cell doesn't then become a primary melanoma. We want better tools to identify those primary melanomas early on so we can remove them and treat them and prevent them from becoming metastatic melanoma. So really 
it, it's not just how do we create better sunscreen or how do we stop the early on in cellular processes, but every step of the way, how do we stop melanoma there so it doesn't get any further? To help applicants uh, identify where their research might fit into this challenge statement, we also then create some focus areas that elaborate what we're trying to accomplish by having this challenge statement. I won't read through all of the focus areas there, but they're depicted in simplified form on the right. So we want to understand basically everything about rare melanomas. So that would be the acral, the mucosal and uvula, uvial, et cetera, melanomas. We know so much less about those as compared to say cutaneous, what are the genetic risk factors? What, um, how do they respond to therapeutics? Why do they respond differently to them as compared to cutaneous? So we have a lot to learn there. What are the risk factors? How do we develop better tools to predict and surveil populations? How do we develop better detection and diagnosis tools? What what do we need to understand how the tumor interacts with its environment in the body? So how does it interact with the immune system? How does it interact with the structures and other cellular components of the skin, so on? And what are the mechanisms that make a primary melanoma transform into a metastatic melanoma? And by understanding this better, hopefully that would lead us to better therapeutic targets and thus preventing um, metastasis. To accomplish these goals and to encourage applications to that meet this focus area and meet our challenge statements of prevention, we offer funding opportunities. And another standout of our CDMRP is really the flexibility that we have to create funding opportunities to target specific areas of need. So whether we think we need more funding opportunities to bring in new and fresh ideas, so maybe someone has a light bulb going on in their head, but they don't really have any preliminary data, but they have a strong rationale for why it might be something, well, then they could apply to a mechanism that's looking for early concepts and early ideas. But as these ideas are developed and mature, uh, we can offer different funding opportunities along that line. And ultimately, we can create funding opportunities for the clinical translation of those ideas to the patient and improve and impact the patient outcomes. Along the bottom of the screen, another way we can target our funding opportunities is for research or development. So if they're, what, if we have this population of young early career investigators, let's offer funding opportunities specific to them and help bring them into the field of melanoma. And then similarly with mid-career and established investigators, offering them opportunities to bring them into the field of melanoma and then keep them there and um, really help us achieve our goals as a program. On this slide, I've chosen a few of our recently funded awards and trying to get a little bit of an idea of how we have used these different funding opportunities to uh, solicit different areas of need. So up top, we have Dr. Sharad Singhal from City of Hope National Medical Center. He recite, received a, an FY19 concept award. Uh, in the focus area that he was trying to meet was therapeutic prevention. And he didn't have a lot of preliminary data. So he's really just exploring this idea of whether a novel protein that he identified called RLIP is a viable therapeutic target. Uh, so far, he's been able to publish some of his results and some of the preliminary data that he's been able to collect using some mouse models is that this protein does cause cell death in melanoma. And so he's pursuing the development of advancing that into more 
uh, human models. The next line is Dr. Cheng Cheng Zhang from University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. He also had an FY19 award, but a translational research award. So this is a mechanism that's really uh, for more mature ideas. And the idea being that they're in the near term poised to impact patients and have clinical benefits. So his project was based around the idea that although there have been vast uh, improvements in treatment options for melanoma, namely being the successes of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is only really uh, successful in treating about 40 to 50 percent of patients. And so his research focuses on a novel set of pro uh, cell surface receptors called LILRB proteins and understanding if these receptors are responsible for therapeutic resistance. And if that pans out, then developing uh, therapeutic options that will decrease this resistance and make immunotherapy a viable option for larger number of patients. And finally on the slide is a team of Jennifer Powers, Rudolph Roll, and Gregory Gray. And they received an FY20 Team Science Award Team Science Awards are really becoming quite popular. It's becoming very well established that a lot of the ideas and challenges left in the various fields of cancer are too big for many investigators working individually or within one lab to really conquer on their own. So we're embracing this idea of funding teams and allowing people from multiple institutions, multiple areas of expertise come together to address one project, one focus. And so this project, uh, this team is building upon a 2014 study that revealed melanoma incidence was 62% higher in active military personnel than the main US population. So their goals are to evaluate possible risk factors for melanoma in our mil active military personnel and really try to parse out some of those risk factors. So do particular risk factors associate with specific subtypes of melanoma? And then if they, depending on how they find that, they will then be able to target um, better prevention strategies to deal with those identified risk factors. And I'll leave you with this today. So we want to encourage you as consumers to become involved and make your voice heard. If you are interested in exploring this option in more detail, please check out the website that's uh, on the bottom of the slide here, cdmrp.army.mil slash cwg. And you'll find information about uh, what's needed for a nomination package. The key points are outlined on the bulleted list to the right. And so for us, you have to be a melanoma survivor. We want you to be active in advocacy, outreach, support organizations, and really understand that if you are to participate in uh, CDMRP's program cycle, that you're representing not just yourself and your personal experiences, but really the community as a whole and being a voice for others who have had similar experiences as yourself. And with that, that was my last slide. So up here are the um, websites for the melanoma research program, and then again, the consumer information site from the CDMRP page. And with that, I will answer questions. Great. Thank you, Amy. That was wonderful. I don't know if you saw in the comments, but some of our advocates were saying that they, they had participated as a consumer reviewer, and it was a wonderful experience. So um, Lots of lots of our advocates have taken advantage of this opportunity and and been a part of the review and it's been a really great experience for them. So oh, wonderful. Oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I, I just now I'm catching up with the comments and that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad to hear that people have enjoyed their experiences. Absolutely. I think it's such a worthwhile experience. And I just have a couple of questions in our remaining minutes. And then again, just a, you know, a, a PSA to everyone watching. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them. Um, but, you know, a lot of times uh, advocates think, well, I, I'm not a medical person. I don't have an MD. I don't have a PhD. Like, what can I bring to this experience? You know, what value can I add? Um, and I know that the applications are dense and they're, they're written in medical language. So maybe you could just kind of talk through what an advocate or consumer reviewer brings to the process and what they can expect. You know, I know they have to be nominated. We nominate a ton of advocates every year. A certain number are, are selected. So maybe you could just share a little bit about what the value they bring and, and what they would experience being a consumer reviewer. Absolutely. So for starters, that, that is something uh, we hear a lot. Um, if you ever do go to our website, you see we do periodically all of the programs uh, post consumer stories. And over my years, as I've been helping edit and write those with our consumers, that that's almost always something that is included in there is how they felt intimidated or unsure at first and were really put at ease once they were in the room with the reviewers. So we're, we're very mindful of that as an organization. And so we don't just accept your, uh, your um, nomination and throw you into the panel. There, there are training, you, you are set up with uh, other consumers, uh, to kind of shadow uh, your given expectations and um, you're not given the same expectations as the scientists and the clinicians to really dive into the technical merits of each application, but where you really shine through and where your voice is particularly valued is we collect um, with our applications, depending on the specific mechanism, but innovation statements impact statements. We ask our applicants to submit lay abstracts. So they give us a technical abstract that gives us their specific aims and goals of, and hypotheses, but also a lay abstract that really translates that for a lay person. And so it's really up to the applicant to make sure that those extra um, pieces of the application convey why someone who uh, a consumer should care about their research. And so that's what we value the consumer perspective on. Uh, people bring to the table their experiences and their challenges that they had. And so when an application speaks to those challenges, they can say, this is important. This is an area of need. I, I can attest to that. Um, or as part of my organization, I have worked with other patients and advocates and I can be that voiced for this community that this this is an issue and we should really take a good look at this and the scientific reviewers will make sure that all the other scientific points support that recommendation yeah absolutely i've heard through uh steve you mentioned him earlier our former board chair um that many times over the years it would really be the consumer advocate that would say hey you know this this doesn't make sense for a melanoma patient. It's great on paper, but it's it's not realistic. And it would actually, you know, change the minds of some of the scientists when they were reviewing it, you know, and sort of seeing the patient perspective. And it was really valuable. Absolutely. And, and another just kind of to add on to that is we get so many applications and so many of them are good that it can be difficult to parse out. Well, how do you decide this good applicant to fund this good application versus the, this good application? Mm -hmm. So that's particularly where the consumer voice can make a difference, a strong difference is, well, this one is more relevant to our needs. And because we have so many passionate advocates, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but I would love to know how the program is marketed to researchers and scientists um, and sort of what that looks like, because I know our advocates are always in front of their, their doctors, and I'm sure that they would be the first one to say, hey, have you applied for a, a DOD MRP a grant? So, so what does that look like and, and how is it promoted sort of the public? So we primarily, um, we have what's uh, our website uh, that's ebrap.org, E-B-R-A-P 
www.ncpsa.org. Um, and that's a website where any potential applicant can go and sign up for our listserv and they can pick the specific programs that are most applicable to their areas of practice or expertise or whatnot and sign up to be notified of our funding opportunities when they're available, um, news about the program. So when we publish highlights to the website or consumers, um, those types of things. So that's, that's the biggest avenue that we have is making sure people know that that resource is available to them. We do have our website um, and we try to connect with our part, you know, with other melanoma organizations and as appropriate or applicable, try to make sure that our partners know when we have things available and if they know um, appropriate audiences. So we're always looking for other um, ways we can improve that. Um, if, if relevant, we've published uh, funding opportunities in publications such as the Cancer Letter, which a lot of different clinicians and researchers uh, advertise for. And so we, we're looking for things like that. We try to promote things on LinkedIn. CDMRP has a Twitter account. So if you want to follow CDMRP on Twitter or Facebook, um, those are some of the uh, ways that we try to reach out. We're always looking for other suggestions too, if there are. That's great. No, I think the, the Twitter handle is a good one. A lot of people are on there. So I have one last question, and this is really a question I've always had. Um, we have patients and caregivers as part of the MRS research grant review process. And I know for the um, CDMRP, it's just melanoma survivors. Is there any thought to including caregivers at any point in the review process? It's, I haven't looked at that specifically myself. I think the main reason we do it um, for melanoma research program for just survivors is that really those are the most likely, they, they just have the most immediate impact and most immediate experiences. Um, other programs do open it up to caregivers and um, parents, especially again, depending on the nature of the disease, especially, but um, so for us as a program um, and other programs also tend to try to focus and give the biggest voice to the actual survivors themselves. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was really helpful, especially as we segue into our next discussion with Ed Long, who's gonna talk a little bit about what our legislative asks are. So Amy, thank you again. And any, any advocates out there that wanna be a part of the re consumer review process, please email advocacy at melanoma.org. We will work with you on your nomination. It is a wonderful program and we really need the patient voice involved as we make major investments in melanoma research. So Amy, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me today. It was my pleasure. All right. And with that, we are gonna segue into our next session, which is the legislative agenda, a review of the MRS legislative asks. So we are going to take a deep dive into what you're going to be asking your lawmakers for uh, with Dr. Ed Long, Vice President, Advanced Boyack Associates. Ed focuses on health policy and funding issues, working with academic medical centers and patient advocacy groups like the Melanoma Research Foundation. Prior to joining the private sector, uh, Ed was staff director at the Senate Labor Health and Human Services and Appropriations Subcommittee, where he worked with former Senator Tom Harkin. He is also a melanoma survivor himself, so he truly cares about what we're doing today and what we want to achieve with our lawmakers. So with that, Ed, I'm going to hand it over to you. Am I, uh, I'm off mute, thank you. You're I good. just want to commend you and Amy and your staff for organizing uh, today's uh, workshop. I've been actually watching most of it. Uh, I particularly was interested in the Liz and Kristen uh, advocacy presentation. Um, Liz would be a tough staffer to uh, respond to, but I think you all have done a very good job and I really appreciate what, what you've done. And I also want to com commend Dr. Bunker for taking over um, from Donna the, uh, the CDMRP MRP program as this is this program is one of the uh, 
principal products of all of your advocacy. Uh, so if we can go next slide, please. Next slide, please. So let's go over the uh, what the ask is. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to say a couple of things. One of which is uh, all of the members, all the staff with whom you'll be meeting with this week, do have a number of leave behinds. Starting with this uh, one pager. Next, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, starting with this uh, presentation plus the various letters referenced. Let me give you a little context of where Congress is at right now. Um, where the main request we're asking for is for fiscal 2023. Uh, that is, that begins, fiscal 23 begins October 1st, 22 and September 30th, 2023. Um, but I wanna caution you that at the same time that you are actually talking to staff Congress is trying to finalize the fiscal 22 appropriations, which includes both our defense money uh, as well as funding for NIH and NCI. Um, so let's start with the defense funded melanoma research program. Our request for fiscal 2023 is supporting $40 million in the fiscal 2023 Department of Defense appropriations bill. Uh, Congresswoman Maloney, who uh, graciously spoke this morning, and uh, really, I can't tell you how critical Carolyn has, Congresswoman Maloney has been for both the defense program and for making advances on FDA uh, regulations of tanning beds. Um, she is, she will be circulating a letter. So when you're talking to the House staffers, then ask them to sign on to Congresswoman Maloney's letter. Once that letter goes out and actually circulates, we can follow up by sending that, uh, that formal, what we call a dear colleague letter to the offices and the staff with whom you're meeting. Um, by way of background for fiscal and for when you're dealing with senators, uh, we do not have a letter being initiated. You can ask your staffer if their senator would be willing to initiate a letter to the Senate Defense Appropriations Subcommittee, uh, or if they can write specifically individual letters, what do we call what we call SAC D, Senate Appropriations Committee Defense Subcommittee, uh, do so. In terms of fiscal 22, which I reference, we are in pretty good shape. We have 40 million in the House bill and 40 million in the Senate bill. Uh, so we should be okay at 40. Uh, we won't probably find out until tomorrow what the final number is when staff are completing their negotiations. So bottom line for the defense request is ask if you're talking to House staff, ask them to sign the Maloney letter, Congresswoman Maloney letter, which should be coming out. If in the Senate, write or initiate uh, their own individual letter, or if they want to initiate a sign-on letter, uh, to be the counterpart to Congresswoman Maloney, please do so. I can follow up with the staff on those points. Fiscal uh, for funding for the National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, and for melanoma specific report language within NCI, we're uh, asking the staff to support the House number, a $3.5 billion increase for NIH and its base funding. And for National Cancer Institute, we're asking to support the House number of $6.9 billion. For fiscal 23, we do not have a number. We're only asking for significant increases in funding for NIH and NCI, and then also to include melanoma specific language, which is also included in the package, which basically serves the purpose of encouraging NCI, National Cancer Institute, uh, to fund particular areas of research in the field of melanoma, which we and our scientific, our team of scientists believe are uh, areas of most of targeted opportunities where money could be most wisely invested. The language is encouraging, not directive, um, but it is to, to give uh, uh, guidance to certain areas. Uh, next page, please. Two other issues are, uh, which are also cited as asking for support 
for CDC Center for Disease Control and Prevention Skin Cancer Prevention Activities. Um, and it, again, asking for $5 million in the fiscal 2023 Labor HHS Appropriations Bill, that's Labor Health and Human Services. The figure for 2022, uh, we expect to see 4 million for that line. That's the same amount as 21, but we're asking for a million dollar increase. This, this gets into the issue of prevention. We know it's modest, but we're trying to ratchet this funding up. Um, last but not least, and this is very, very important, and Carolyn Maloney, Congressman Maloney specifically elaborated on, is the whole issue of FDA uh, regulation of tanning beds and particularly uh, move to the federal level what's been done in 22 states is ban the use of tanning beds by minors. Uh, as Congresswoman Maloney mentioned, the Obama administration back in 2015 had uh, written up a proposed rule, two proposed rule on sunlight, most of but the second one is on the uh, tanning, use of tanning beds. That got stuck, didn't actually proceed at the uh, last year of the Obama administration and the Trump administration did not pursue it. But right now, as a result or in response to a letter that was sent by Congresswoman Maloney last August, FDA has said it's their intent to issue and finalize a final up rule by May, sometime in May of this year. Uh, we've asked, we've written and included in your packet is a draft letter asking your rep or your senator to send to FDA, encouraging them to live up to their commitment and finalize this rule uh, as, as they initially announced their intention. This is a follow-up again, basically to nudge FDA saying, we are, Congress is looking at them, we're tracking it, and we want them to follow up on their commitment to finalize this rule. Again, if you could, if the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, could issue a proposed rule at, uh, on a federal level, this would serve as a base for, uh, that would cover all states, not just the 22 that have enacted legislation. Next slide, please. So again, on Department of Defense, I've elaborated on it. We're asking for 40 million. Next slide, please. This is the Congresswoman Maloney letter, which is also going to be in the packet that staff received. So you can cite this. Uh, if you're in the house, we ask them to contact Congresswoman Maloney's office. The staffer in Maloney's office is Charles Williams. Um, and again, uh, you can, we can send you the email. It's charles.williams at mail.house.gov. Um, again, we're asking House members to sign this letter, uh, which in, again is uh, 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 being circulated by Congressman Maloney that would go to the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee of the House Appropriations Committee. Again, uh, if you're talking to a Senator, we ask that they uh, send their own letter. We can shape it to reflect the fact that it goes to the chair and ranking member on the SACD subcommittee on the Senate side. Next slide, please. So this is for NIH. I went over before, again, for 23, increased funding for NIH and NCI and melanoma specific report language. Next slide, please. This is the melanoma specific report language, which was written up uh, by, it was coordinated by Dr. Allison Martin, who serves on the board of MRF. Um, who also worked at NCI and also FDA, uh, but she coordinated this language with our science, scientific team uh, to identify most targeted opportunities. Um, we can again follow up. And if you have any, if there's any questions by staff, please get back to Amy or me uh, and uh, we can follow up with the staff. Next slide, please. Okay, for CDC, we mentioned again, uh, 5 million for, this is for fiscal 23, for CDC skin cancer prevention activities. Um, this sort of self explained we are working with the Academy of Dermatology and making this, formulating this request. 
Uh, next slide, please. So the, this is the issue of FDA ban on minors use of tanning beds. Again, this is something that we've been working on at least since 2009. Uh, the first was to upgrade the uh, uh, regulation, uh, re regulatory regime. So now it's basically a schedule two, but now uh, uh, which basically require, which includes a warning label. Uh, we want to um, amend that and to require, a, to institute a ban on the use of tanning beds by minors. That is any person less than 18 years of age. Um, the, this, uh, this rule, there's a proposed rule on the docket. We're asking FDA to, uh, to, to finalize that rule. Uh, and of course, we expect we might get, we, we anticipate there might be some opposition by the Indoor Tanning Association. Um, but we think that given, particularly in its impact on young women and on the statistics of exposure, anybody exposed at any time to a tanning bed has a higher incidence of, uh, um, of, of melanoma and skin cancer. We feel that this is a very important, absolutely critical preventive uh, step that needs to be taken. Uh, we're not asking to ban tanning beds as some countries have to at least, but we're asking for banning use by minors. Next slide, please. Uh, this is some background that you can get into, uh, you know, about melanoma's leading cause of cancer death in women ages 15 to 29. Uh, again, I think that a number of you folks referenced that, uh, that many of you will be meeting with female staffers, uh, young staffers in that age group. So they would be, if they haven't, they would be particular in, particularly interested in the issue of tanning beds and its impact on particularly on young women. Um, but there's some statistics here you can use that would be, be important in terms of your presentation, uh, in terms of risks associated with use of tanning beds by individuals under 18 are uh, concerning given the widespread use of these devices. Um, you know, there's some statistics here that can be useful in your presentation. The next slide, please. And this is, I mentioned, a letter, a draft of a letter to be sent to Dr. Califf, who is the commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration that you can give, that staff will have in their packet. But if you could request that their member of the House or the Senate send to the Food and Drug Administration uh, and ask also as well if they can send us a copy so we have that material in our file. Next slide, please. A little bit about uh, targets uh, in terms of congressional targets and who is, uh, who is absolutely critical. You're not gonna be meeting with all of these members, but if you do, these staff, these members actually play a more enhanced role uh, because they're on the subcommittee that in the case of defense actually funds the defense program. So let me just go briefly over. We can send over, I'm looking at some of the Q and A, uh, we can send over the list of uh, members who signed on to the letter from last year, uh, which is the Maloney letter. So in terms of the defense creations, Betty McCollum, Minnesota, Tim Ryan, De Betty McCollum is the chair, Tim Ryan, Ohio, Rufensberger, Maryland, Captor, Ohio, Cuellar, Texas, Kilmer, Washington State, Aguilar, California, Bustos, Illinois, Charlie Crist, Florida, Ann Kirkpatrick, Arizona. On the R side, Ken Calvert is from California, Hal Rogers, Kentucky, Cole, Oklahoma, Womack, Arkansas, Adderhall, uh, Alabama, Carter, Texas, Diaz Ballard, Florida. Let's go on the Senate members. Uh, so on the Senate defense appropriations, uh, John Tester of Montana, very important. Richard Durbin has been very helpful in this program. Uh, uh, Illinois, Pat Leahy, Vermont. Uh, Pat, uh, Senator Leahy is retiring, but his wife, Marcella, had stage three cancer, melanoma, pardon me. Diane Feinstein, California, Murray, Washington State. Jack Reed uh, has been very helpful on skin cancer 
uh, issues uh, from uh, Rhode Island, Brian Schatz is Hawaii, Tammy Baldwin, Wisconsin, excuse me, Jean Shaheen, New Hampshire. On the R side, Shelby is from Alabama. He's retiring. He's going to be, he's both chair of the full, uh, he's both ranking on full appropriations and also in defense. He'll be re replaced probably by Susan Collins of Maine. Mitch McConnell, majority leader, minority leader from Kentucky, Susan Collins, Maine, Murkowski, um, Alaska, Lindsey Graham, South Carolina, Roy Blunt, Missouri, Jerry Moran, Kansas, Hoven, North Dakota, Bozeman, Arkansas. Uh, these are all very important. Let me just go over Labor H. Okay, and the, this is the subcommittee that funds NIH, NCI, and CDC. Um, so Rosa DeLora of, uh, is from Connecticut. She's the chair on the House Labor, what we call Labor HHS. Uh, Roy Allard, California, Barbara Lee, California, Mark Pocan, Wisconsin, Catherine Clark, Massachusetts, Lois Frankel, Florida, Bustos, Illinois, Watson Coleman, New Jersey, Tom Cole, Oklahoma, is the ranking member, that's ranking Republican, Andy Harris, uh, Maryland, Fleischman, Tennessee, Herrera Butler, Washington State, Molinar, Michigan, Ben Klein, Virginia. Let's go over the Senate. Okay. The, again, this is the House Senate counterpart to the House subcommittee. Um, we have uh, Patty Murray, Washington State, Richard Durbin, Illinois. You see a number of these members are also in defense probes. Uh, Jack Reed, Rhode Island, Jeff Merkley, Oregon, Schatz, Hawaii, Baldwin, Wisconsin, Chris Murphy, Connecticut, Joe Manchin, West Virginia. Uh, on the Republican side, Roy Blunt, who, who will be retiring uh, at the end of this year, is the ranking member from Missouri. Shelby, again, as you notice, he's ranking on defense probes. He's also on Labor HHS. From Alabama, Lindsey Graham, South Carolina, Jerry Moran, Kansas, uh, Shelley Moore Capito, West Virginia, John Kennedy, Louisiana, Cindy Hyde Smith, Mississippi, Mike Braun, Indiana, Marco Rubio, Florida. Let's go, uh, let me just pause for a second. So now we've gone over the issues, we can do questions at the end. Uh, I'll ask Aretha to send out the Maloney letter from last year that can, can show you the 30 plus members who signed on the Maloney letter. Um, so how to make the most of your meetings Let's just move down to advocacy. Um, okay, what we've done now, let's do's and don'ts. Let me just go, go over in terms of, uh, okay, uh, let me go over what to expect before we do the do's and don'ts. Um, I know there have been a lot of uh, granular discussion about how to conduct yourself during a meeting. Um, and you did a little bit of a how-to, but let me just give you sort of the overall picture. First off, you'll be meeting with congressional staff, and I know that the state rep meeting spent a lot of time talking about why staff are very important. Uh, it's even more important when you deal with House and Senate members than you're dealing with state assembly people, uh, because there's so many other issues that members of Congress are dealing with and as I can tell you, as a staffer, uh, staffers play a very important role about highlighting certain issues and being uh, very key to make decision making by members of Congress. So you assume you have no more than 30 minutes. You may have 15, but generally speaking, I've found that uh, in this Zoom virtual age, you're you probably have 20 to 30 minutes, uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, no longer than 30 minutes for your Zoom call. Staff, it's a mixed bag. Some staff will, be, will call in. Not all staff will uh, be, will be having their image on the screen. Some of that is because they're working within their office and on, on the Hill. Some of them don't, you know, have for, for, pri for privacy reasons, do one, don't, don't want to expose 
um, their home office to the wider community. Um, but don't be surprised if you only see, you know, that little image of the, 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 the staffer's initials with a phone number without their image. So don't let that put you off. Um, recognize that, so you have to be coordinated in terms of your presentation. I know a number of uh, folks have particularly, um, Liz and Kristen have said, think beforehand before you go into the meeting. If you have several other members uh, of your team or your state also in the meeting, best to have coordinate, have a team leader, make sure that you get your presentation locked in. And then also both your presentation is talking about who you are, what your experience with melanoma is, which we'll get into, and then to go into the ass. So you have to do this all in that less than 30 minutes. So you have to be very concise also to allow you know, time for questions. Um, so you need to have be very succinct, very organized in your presentation. And also I think it's very important at the end of the, of the meeting specifically to make a specific request for staff to sign on to the Maloney letter or staff to send a letter to FDA uh, or staff to write the appropriations committee in support of uh, the melanoma specific report language. And we can follow up. I specifically do complete a lot of those forms that were referenced early. So a couple of things about do's and don'ts. Uh, if you're not speaking, uh, keep yourself muted. Uh, resolve technical difficulties prior to the meeting. And Aretha uh, Robinson will be, who's basically coordinating the logistics of all these, uh, of these uh, teams and Zoom meetings. I think they're teams meetings. Uh, she can wa she'll walk you through briefly on that. Uh, make sure that the staffer is on the call before starting. Uh, make the staffer feel welcome. Tell your story related to the ask. Um, you know, re-ask in yes or no format. Uh, request contact information to follow up and thank the staffer for their time. These are all specific, uh, you know, uh, you know, and be, be careful when you're, you know, presenting yourself uh, that you remember you have an image, you have a screen and what's uh, on the screen is reflective, not just of you, but it's also reflective of the Melanoma Research Foundation. Next slide, please. Uh, don'ts, uh, don't have any background distractions. I must admit, I've noticed pets. My cat sometimes frequently comes and joins me. Uh, she's a, a, a television personality now. Young children don't have any, but sometimes that can happen. Um, don't, show, don't show up late. Uh, no, re remember, you can be, you have to be on time. Staff may show up late, but the one thing is, this, I hate to say this, though, you, though staff works for you and the members work for you, you have to be respectful of staff's time. Um, be, don't be disrespectful. Don't interrupt or talk over. Uh, and don't be argumentative. Um, someone asked a question about what happens or how do you deal with somebody who's cantankerous or says no. Um, uh, I think the point is you have to be respectful. Uh, repeat your message. Uh, if there's any need for follow-up and you don't have an answer, don't make up an answer. Uh, go to Amy or me and I, we will, I will follow up with the staff um, for any kind of questions or additional material. I do think that if there's any, and, and I think both uh, Liz and Kristen mentioned this, uh, don't hesitate to follow up with the staff after your meeting to give them information and to say, if you had need any more information, here's the letter, the Maloney letter, or here's the letter to FDA. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you need anything more, please give me a heads up about whether you agreed to sign on, stuff like that. Um, generally speaking, I actually follow up with staff um, and ask them whether they will submit this request or sign on to the letter as well. Uh, again, don't ramble, stay concise to the point. Uh, don't read off a personal device. Don't answer another phone while you're on it. All these things are pretty obvious. 
um, um, and don't say anything negative. And, and if you actually don't mention politics, fundraising or anything else that's illegal, um, even though it might be the perfect call according to one person, or if anybody watches Curb Your Enthusiasm, that was one of the last shows of Larry David, uh, don't, rich and fun, don't link fundraising or political engagement with the, with the legislative policy as that's a no-no. Okay, uh, anything at next slide is your next slide. State caucus breakout. So this is also in terms of, this gets into how to organize your call, make sure you have a team leader because that would be the person who starts the call. Uh, there will be somebody from v Van Skoik Associates starting the call, doing the technical issue, but you need to have somebody from your team, particularly if you have other uh, uh, members of MRF advocates on your call who coordinates everything, ensures the meeting flows as planned, keeps track of time, uh, directs the other participant. Um, impact uh, storyteller, it, it's helpful as mentioned, make it very concrete, but also you need to also know, I think specifically what this doesn't say, is say that you're from the district or you're from the state, identifying where you're from, so they know that you're, you know, that there's a constituent angle to it. Um, also briefly uh, talk about your experience with melanoma, not extensive. And again, as someone said, don't get into the clinical details, uh, but it'd be not helpful to have an experience. And also, for example, if you got had if you if you had if you used tanning beds as, as a, a teenager, and now you have melanoma or something like that. Um, you know, again, make it very very concrete. Um, then somebody needs to at the midway through has to make the request to go through the request. Uh, and also not only go through the issues, but then make sure that you make the request, sign on to the Maloney Defense Letter. If you're in the Senate, you know, send a letter to SAC, Senate Defense Appropriations Subcommittee. On FDA, um, you know, write a letter on tanning beds to the uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, uh, finalizing, asking that to finalize the proposed rule uh, banning the use of tanning beds by minors. Um, helpful to have a note taker uh, to follow up. Uh, and also I think it's very important that there be a follow up email to the staff to appreciate their taking the time to, um, to, you know, to, to hear you out and also to follow up with a member. Next slide, please. Meeting structure, again. Uh, this is our, the introductory part. Thank the staffer. Uh, the team leader facilitates the introduction to the team, where they're from, personal experience. We're here to talk about, and also I think that uh, it's helpful to make a brief reference to who you hear on behalf, Melanoma Research Foundation, to give a pitch for MRF. Preview the ass. You know, we're here to talk about melanoma specific issues, funding for research, skin cancer prevention, tanning beds, um, and then restate the ask describe melanoma and its impact on you, and then restate the ask. Um, if the state doesn't ban, Liz, um, these, again, um, this is a federal, that's preempts states or intercedes where states don't. So we're not focusing on breaking out between which states have tanning bed bans or not, because this is federal, which would universalize across the federal government across all the states, tanning beds. So whether it's banned in the state or not is not relevant per se, though if you're from a state that uh, has bans use, then you can cite that to say, we're just trying to federalize this. Uh, and restate the ask, uh, support the 40 million, um, um, support uh, NCI melanoma specific report language, 5 million for CDC skin cancer prevention activities, and write FDA asking them to finalize the proposed rule banning use of tanning bed by minors. I think that's, and is there another one, Aretha here? I think that's it, right? And again, follow up. I think that's it. Uh, Aretha, do you want to sort of take uh, a brief moment, a couple moments to uh, talk about the technical aspects of these uh, calls? 
Yeah, I think, um, I believe Amy sent out to everyone um, a video that we made last year, which includes um, how to do the team's meeting. Um, I believe everyone has that. If anyone has any issues, just please reach out to me. Everyone should have my email address. Um, I just want to touch on a few things that Ed might have um, kind of brought up regarding the contact information and asking the staffer. Every you already have everyone's contact information. I sent <coughs> the advocates that when I sent you your schedules in those emails, you have all the contact information for everyone that you're meeting with. So you don't need to ask them for contact information. They may offer it to you nine times out of 10, they do. And you can say, oh, I already have it. Or you can take it again if you want. But I just want to let you know, you, you have all the email addresses. Um, if you can't attend a meeting, just please reach out to me as soon as possible, even if it's at the last minute. Um, just let me know. Um, regarding moderating the meetings, as Ed mentioned, someone from VSA, it's either me or someone on my team, um, me, uh, Toria, Liz or Rick, those are the, or myself are the four people you'll see on these meetings. Please just be advised that, as Ed said, these meetings are about 30 minutes. When you go to open that email, that, that calendar invite, look to see how long that meeting is. There are one or two meetings that are actually like 15 minutes because that's all the staffer has. So just make sure you look at that because I don't want you to get into the meeting and then they're like, we need to cut this off. So you know ahead of time that this is a 15 minute meeting or if it's the full 30 minutes. And also just be cognizant of we moderators are moderating all these meetings. So the meetings cannot go past 30 minutes because we're doing meetings back to back. And some of you have meetings back to back. So they need to end at that half hour mark, if not before, um, but they have to end at that 30 minutes. Um, please do not share your screen. As Ed mentioned, 50% of the time, the staffer may not come on camera. So there's no need to share your screen because they can't see it anyway. If you do have something that you wanna share with the staffer, you can definitely email it to them or email it to me and I'll send it to them. But um, please do not share your screen. It just takes up a little bit more time and it's just not necessary if the staffer can't see it um, anyway. Um, I've sent out all the schedules. If there's any changes throughout the week, I will send them to you. And um, I think that's it, unless anybody has any questions. Um, there's some Q&A here. Should I uh, just deal with that, um, Amy? Yeah, and I can jump in and, and go through the Q&A with you. And I oh, think- Oh, good, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the questions that was asked earlier was last year's letter, the signatures on the Maloney letter. And we're gonna circulate that to everyone so they could see who signed the letter last year. You had mentioned that earlier. I just your... sent it to Amy and uh, Aretha and you. Perfect. All right, so we'll, we'll get that out to everyone. Um, couple of questions here, going back to the indoor tanning. One of the questions is how powerful is the Tanning Bed Association in Congress? You know, I, it's an interesting question and I've sort of, the, the Indoor Tanning Association seems to be more powerful and influential on state level. Um, the, um, the, um, now I do know that they have met with FDA. They've met, they do meet with uh, Office of Management and Budget. Um, one of the um, concerns, and I think that we had is, there is something called the Congressional Review Act, whereby if a, um, a rule or regulation has a, potential impact on business, that there's a way of uh, expediting review uh, of, the, uh, of the proposed rule and pulling it back. So we have not had that tested. One of the reasons why we basically did not pursue pushing FDA during the Trump administration, one, we didn't think we'd get a favorable response from the Trump administration. Um, and the second is with Republicans in control, we felt that we were at a competitive disadvantage, um, which is why we feel really strongly about pushing FDA to get this thing uh, finalized this year. So where Congress is still controlled by the by Democrats uh, in both in the House and Senate. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks, Ed. Um, another question, this one's from one of our advocates, Michelle. 
So her representative um, has been silent for 2021 and hasn't responded. Yeah. Yeah. I saw, I'm, I'm sorry, Michelle. I saw your email and I've been doing a million things this morning. Um, I've sent follow-ups, two follow-ups to the staffer and just haven't heard anything back. But Michelle, I'm going to give you the staffer's email address and you can definitely reach out to them and, and, and directly correspond with them. But I just didn't receive anything back from her office for a meeting this week. But I would also say that um, Congresswoman Spanberger signed on to Maloney's letter last year. Um, and I think what you can do is um, once you get that, once you get that um, letter from last year, you can include that in whatever packet you send over to uh, the Congresswoman staffer, staff, along with the other leave behinds. Uh, so uh, then we can follow, I will follow up with the Congresswoman Spanberger, as well as, you know, all the other members who have signed on from last year. You want me to go through the list, Kylie, of who signed yeah. on last year? Yeah, why don't you just verbally go through it and we'll, we'll follow up and send it out, but I think that would be great. Yeah, so obviously Carolyn Maloney, Danny Davis from Illinois, Joaquin Castro from Texas, Earl Blumenauer from Portland, Oregon, Susan Wild, is she, I can't remember, is she Pennsylvania or Virginia? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark DeSalinaire from uh, California. Uh, Nanette Diaz Barragan from uh, uh, California. Jan Schakowsky from Chicago and Illinois. Manuel Cleaver, is he from Missouri? Yes. From Missouri. Jerry Connolly from Virginia. Mm -hmm. Richie Neal, Richard Neal from Massachusetts. Katie Porter <coughs> pardon me, from Southern California, Bobby Scott from Virginia, David Scott is from Georgia, uh, Congresswoman Omar is from Minnesota, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sean Caston, I think he's from Wisconsin. Yeah. Uh, Abigail Spanberger, again, Virginia. Bill Keating, William Keating from Massachusetts. Nikema Williams, I'm not sure where she's from. She's new, I can't remember. Georgia. I can't we'll find out. But Nick, yeah. uh, uh, Don Beyer is from Virginia. Peter DeFazio from Oregon is from Eugene. And Madeline Dean is from Pennsylvania. Great. Thanks, yes, Nikema Williams is Georgia. Georgia, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lisa. So yeah, we'll, we'll send that around to everyone as well. And I think it was great to just go over that, Ed. Um, one logistics question, Aretha, this is more for you. Are all the attendees who are meeting visible on the invite? Yes, it's, yes, they should be able to see who, who else is. An email, right. They should be able to see the email addresses. Okay, okay, yeah. great. And, all, and also when I sent out the emails, the email itself, not just the invite, on the email itself, it was sent to, I didn't blind copy anyone. So anyone's name, you know, email address is on the, on the, on the email itself. Okay, yeah. great. Well, I think that wraps up all of our questions. Uh, thank you both. This was really helpful. And Aretha, I know you'll be still communicating with all the advocates and yes. scheduling and doing all that stuff. Aretha's a superstar when it comes to <laughs> scheduling all that stuff. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Aretha. Um, I just have You're a couple welcome. closing closing comments as we wrap up day one. Kylie, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Okay, rest of the day. Thanks. Um, so just, just a few closing comments. Again, I want to thank every one of our panelists today. I think it was a really incredible day. I hope you all learned a lot. I want to Thank our corporate sponsors for their support of this program and all of you, our MRF advocates out there. I think you're going to have a fantastic week. Your voices matter. What you're doing this week really matters and it benefits all of the melanoma patients from across the United States. So thank you so much. Um, again, Congress will act swiftly to support our increased ask for um, research funding. So it's really important. Again, practice, practice. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to advocacy at melanoma.org. And again, never underestimate, underestimate the impact that your story can make in the political landscape. So 
Um, again, just some general housekeeping items. We will be following up with a survey uh, towards the beginning of next week on this session, as well as follow up from your meetings. You will be getting texts or emails depending on your opt-in status throughout the rest of this week. Again, please direct questions at advocacy at melanoma.org. And now after this session, we're gonna invite you to meet with your fellow state advocates to practice how you're gonna share your story with your lawmakers and make your legislative asks. So please use the link provided in the chat to join. And again, thank you all so much for your support. We are very excited to see you all in person in 2023 and back in front of our lawmakers on Capitol Hill. So thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your day and a great week of meetings. Thank you.